Here it is. Uh, new colors, right? New colors in products. Now these products you may or may not be familiar with, but I encourage you, if you already have a predetermined idea of whether you are a fan or use these products or not, I highly recommend watching this demo because you might learn uh, some things about it. You still may not like it after the end of the demo, but you might learn some things about it as to what makes these products so specific. Because uh, for me as a maker, I absolutely love different types of products. In all the years that I've been with Ranger, I've learned so much about the characteristics, not only of product, but of substrates. And that's really allowed kind of the exploration, if you will, of using products together. Okay, so Archival Ink, if you're not familiar with Archival Ink, this is Archival Ink. Archival Ink is Ranger's line, okay? It is an oil-based permanent ink, okay? That's what makes it very unique. There are so many different types of waterproof permanent inks on the market, and you pretty much have to learn the characteristics of each one. Uh, many of them are solvent-based. Uh, there are some oil-based ones out there, but, but most of the time they are solvent-based inks. And this one is actually an oil-based solvent ink, which is really interesting. Because it is waterproof, that means it's permanent on many surfaces. Also because it's oil-based, it has a slower drying time than solvent-based ink. So if you compare this, say, to Stazon, Stazon's a great permanent ink, but it dries very, very quickly. That's what it's designed to do. Uh, but the fact that this is oil-based is also going to allow us to do some really cool techniques with the properties of this ink. So then what's the whole distress archival? Well, Ranger allows um, designers at times to create our color palettes with this formulation, right? So when you see, for example, distress archival, it's the same formulation as the regular archival ink, but it's in my palette of distress, right? And Dean has done some and Di's done some and Wendy's done some. There's just that kind of combination where it is the same formulation but the branding, the co-branding or designer branding just means that it's in our palette. And when these first came out, I was uh, allowed to, we first did them in like these big ink pads that kind of had the four quadrants. And, you know, as a, as a maker or stamper, I wasn't really too keen on it. But then uh, I did minis a few years ago of colors. These were the first sets. They've, they're sold in these sets of four, right? And so we did kind of a warm, cool, and neutral. And these have been uh, all we've had for forever really for years and then I think it was I, I think it was last year it was last year uh, we ended up doing the stack right where I got like regulation size ink pads of four colors and I just want to point that out that uh, Ranger's direction with distress archival is really to keep them in minis the only ink pads that I got in the what I call the regulation size right the big size um, are the neutral colors that I did so and they're sold in a stack of four but I wanted to take you through and talk about archival and I wanted to talk about glaze because you're going to just see uh, so many cool things. So the new Distress Archivals, as I mentioned, they're sold in kits, right? It's just the easiest way to do it. So we have kits four, five, and six. But what I'm really excited about, not only did we do uh, new colors of archival, was the timing was really perfect. We actually had new Distress colors that I was able to do in archival. So a shout out to Ranger for letting me switch some around last minute because these were... These were in the works for quite a while, but then as these new colors came out, I'm like, oh, can I switch this color for this new color? So I love that they allowed me to do it. So we have Speckled Egg, Evergreen Bow, Wild Honey, and Kitsch Flamingo, right? So in the archival formulation. Then in this kit, we have Crackling Campfire, Crushed Olive, Salvage Patina. Woohoo, we know how much we love that. Villainous Potion, oh, it's so good. And then this kit, we have Rustic Wilderness, Fired Brick, a favorite frayed burlap and prize ribbon. So each new set has some of the newer distress colors in it, which is awesome. And I'll talk about swatches. I'll do color comparison, all of that. And then we have some new distress embossing glazes. If you're not familiar with distress embossing glaze, these are all translucent embossing powders. We can see through them. And usually, or I would say previously, not usually, previously, all of the, the initial colors that I did in the embossing glaze were vintage, right? The vintage inspired colors, you know, tattered rose, cracked pistachio, some of those real kind of grungy colors. And that's all the glazes have really been. But because it's springtime and because we wanted to do new colors, I decided to dive into the, the bright area of distress. So Diane would be proud of me because there are some bright colors in the distress palette. 
and do glazes in those colors. So the new colors of glaze, we have picked raspberry, candied apple, wild honey, twisted citron, salty ocean, and wilted violet. Now, uh, I'll go through the swatches of both and then we'll get into the demo, okay? So first things first, let's talk about archival. So archival ink, what you need to remember is that it is an oil-based waterproof ink. Why do I need a waterproof ink? Well, if you're stamping, it's a great stamping ink and because it's oil-based, it provides great detail. But like any other product, your surface is key, okay? The surface you choose and you work on is going to ultimately determine how a product works. It doesn't matter what the product is. It doesn't matter how many videos you've watched. If you are not connecting to what that particular person is using that product on, your results may vary. Now, it doesn't mean they're gonna be worse by any means. You might find a paper that is perfect for that particular medium. But sometimes people just dismiss the idea of paper, buy a product, and they're like, oh, this doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work on that paper, but if you, if you work on the right substrates, you're going to get a different effect. So case in point, these are my swatches for archival. And I like to do many different things when it comes to, uh, I think, working on, on different mediums, okay? So the first is comparing it on a coated or an uncoated paper. Let me just, I'm gonna take this ring off actually. I'll try not to get these uh, out, of, out of sorts, but I'll just take off that little wire ring, okay? So I'll take just the first color. So this is the new, this is Kitsch Flamingo, okay? So there's three different papers that I stamp on. And all I do is just take a stamp, right? Love a good rubber stamp. I love to uh, create your own collages. That's the beauty of cling, you know, so you can take different elements, put it together. Um, for these, we just put it in a stamp platform so you kind of have the ability to repeat. But here's what I want to show you. This one, this is a coated cardstock. So this one is called specialty stamping paper. And I'm gonna talk about uh, the specifics of paper uh, as we get into the demo. But this is Distress Specialty Stamping. And what it is, it is a matte coated cardstock. So it's coated on both sides, okay? Doesn't have a gloss to it. This, this is just the mixed media white heavy stock. A great cardstock for inking specifically if you do distress techniques. Not bad for stamping, but it is an uncoated paper. Now right away, we can see the difference in color. They're both white cardstock, but why so different? Anything coated, you have to think of it as, an, as a light source. It's gonna reflect, right? It's gonna reflect some light in there. That will usually make your color appear more vibrant. An uncoated paper, even though it's the same ink color, is porous, so it's gonna pull some of your color down into the fibers of the paper and often make it a little bit darker, just a tad. It doesn't completely change the color, but it certainly makes it more dull, if you will. Also detail, right? You're gonna get amazing detail on a coated paper because archival ink, because it's oil-based, sits on the surface. On a porous paper, we start losing any of that really fine detail. Doesn't mean we don't get detail, but we don't get the same quality of detail on an uncoated paper if we're stamping. Now, does that matter? Not really, not with most stamps, right? If you're just doing you know, a cool solid stamp or a background stamp, but if you're doing detail stamping and you want the, the most crisp detail, say it's a, a face or in this case, kind of an engraving where you wanna see all the lines, well, coated paper is gonna be your jam and I'll talk about why I like uh, specialty stamping specifically. But let's not forget that you can do different card stocks. Now this is craft. Craft is incredibly porous, right? It's all recycled. So the ink really wants to soak and almost becomes a bit of an invisible ink. But the nice thing about archival being oil-based is your color shows up better on craft than if you were just to stamp with regular distress ink, right? Because distress ink is water-based and it has a tendency to seep in even further into the paper. So from a color factor, it's nice. Let's just take another color. This is picked raspberry. So you see, it's not just that. Now, your bolder colors, you won't see as much of a difference, but there's still a difference, right? In the, in the intensity between coated, uncoated, and craft. But really, all of the colors are going to work out beautifully. Now, the great thing as far as adding some new colors, right? So in the initial one, we had Barn Door, which I love this red. It's a great red. It is a little bit on the the orangey side, but it's still a nice red. I love how this shows up on the different papers, but I'm really happy to uh, have fired brick now. I love a, a dirty red, right? A black brick red. And so the difference of this, you can see, it's just a bit dirtier, right? Very nice, and you can see, especially on craft, right? That fired brick stamps much dirtier than barn door. So playing around with your different papers, my point is that you're going to get 
some different tones or different shades, different tonalities. Even if I jump down into, well, let's go into blues. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> Evergreen Bow. It's one of the new ones. I like Evergreen Bow. It's, it's one of those colors that started out seasonal, but it's a really cool color because it's kind of a deep patina. Could be green, could be blue. Just has that cool property. But take a look at those uh, from coated to uncoated and craft. Right? It's a nice color to stamp with. So archival generally is for stamping, but I'm gonna share with you uh, how we can take it beyond that and how we can do techniques and why I wanted archival in the distress line. It wasn't just about like, ooh, I, you know, I want more things with the color names on it. It's not it. I like this formulation and how it works with distress inks, sprays, uh, that sort of thing. So that's really how I do my swatches. Specialty stamping, which is coded. Uh, white heavy stock. If you don't work on white heavy stock, maybe it's watercolor, do that and then craft. I always say when it comes to swatches, because some people love swatches, I do, because I like to really see how it's going to work, but you need to do swatches on the substrates you use. It doesn't have to be these. If you don't use these, don't waste your time doing swatches on them, because what you see is not what you're gonna get if you're doing a different paper. So whatever your favorite paper is, and you can have your own favorites, just make sure that if you're going to take the time to do swatches, do swatches on the papers that you use, okay? So those are, my archival. Let's stack them up. Put my little wire in because I again just want to. Nice swatches. Nice swatches. We had a good time, right? Yeah, there's a lot of yeah it was teamwork because uh, with archival, because it's oil based, you can't just wipe it off, right? Some people go, ooh, you know, it's like distress. You can just wipe off the stamp to clean it. Denied. You can't. If you do that, you will quickly contaminate your color and your ink pad. So let's talk about uh, archival itself. Because it's oil based, you're going to need some type of cleaner if you truly want to clean the stamp off. Okay, this is archival cleaner. Does that mean it's the only cleaner that works with this? No, but you do need something other than water because this is oil-based and oil and water will resist each other. So when it comes to cleaning, archival ink cleaner, little dab of it on, clean it off, and I'll talk about cleaning in the demo, but it is important to remember that uh, if you're gonna be doing swatches because you might wipe it off and go, oh, it looks clean. Archival will react archival. So if you have any other residual color of archival on your stamp and you use another ink pad, it will, even though that feels dry to the touch, you can't touch it, you can't get it off on your hands, but that new color will re-wet that ink. Maybe you like that. Maybe you like that mixed color, but you probably won't like it over time when it starts to contaminate ink pads that way, okay? Then the glaze. As I mentioned, the embossing glaze, I like just these little swatch sticks. It just depends. Like when I do swatches, I don't have a, a standard form. For these, I just love a good swatch stick. It's like paint, okay? As I mentioned, the previous colors were all vintage inspired. I love those vintage tones. And then of course, as we added new colors to distress like Kitsch Flamingo, uh, it got a glaze with that as well. Um, I do similar swatches, but on different paper. So this one I don't do coated. So this is white heavy stock. This is mixed media, which has a little bit of a cream tone. You can see the difference, mixed media heavy stock and then craft. So all of these are uh, the heavy stocks, white mixed media and craft. And you can see because the glaze is translucent, how it will totally change based on paper color. Even the most subtle change, like Kitsch Flamingo, right? The true color, a little bit dirtier, almost like worn lipstick, actually. Uh, and then we have Craft. But now we've got these new colors, and, and it's very, it's easy to identify them in this swatch because when you see like this really woo, bold, vivid color, those are gonna be the new glazes. So I do love that bright, vivid picked raspberry, right? You can see in here, Candied apple, really nice bright red. It's gonna be great for the holidays. We'll talk about wild honey, because wild honey, I think it is often uh, misunderstood. <laughs> That's all I can say, it's misunderstood. Wild honey is a weird color, okay? Um, it's a yellow that thinks it's a yellow because it's friends with yellow, but it often thinks it's an orange because it's friends with orange. It's like honey, right? Sometimes it looks more yellow, sometimes it looks more orange depending on what it's with. So I really like that in the glaze because when you put it on different substrates, you get a different effect, right? From a vibrancy to a little ochre to even almost amber if you're putting it over something dark compared to fossilized amber. Look at that twisted citron, whoo, nice limey color even becomes more limey when you do mixed media because that has a little yellow, but still shows up nice on craft. Then we go in, you can just pop right over to the, the bright blue, right? You got salty ocean, really nice bright blues. And again, it's going to change. It's gonna give you almost a nice uh, denim color, that salty ocean on craft, compared to prize ribbon that has quite a bit of black in there. Okay, so a really nice addition to the blues. 
And then when we get into purples, we had Villainous, right, which is awesome. But now we have a much brighter purple with Wilted Violet. But it's interesting because on craft, it kind of has a little Dusty Concord vibe to me. But anyway, um, I just like, I like making swatches. I like seeing swatches. I like to just have them all uh, there on a ring because what you see uh, is all, often very different, especially in an embossing powder, if you've done embossing powders, uh, different to the powders themselves. So let's go into technique. We'll talk about uh, the different products. I'll try to answer questions as we get into the demo and go from there and move this off. Before you start the demo, yes. I had a lot of questions about reinkers. Okay. So this is only my opinion. For what it's worth, it's my opinion. Okay. Um, when it comes to ink pad maintenance, okay, it's up to you on how you want to maintain your ink pads. It could be archivals. It could be oxide. It could be distress ink. Okay. It could be anything. You're the one that really needs to determine um, how you want to maintain your ink pads. Here's what I know, okay? I do know this. An ink pad is made up of some type of material. Some pads are felt, like these are felt. It's got a really uh, tight woven material under there, laminated in a piece of linen to keep all the little fibers off your stamps. Some ink pads are a foam, right? That's like a, a compressed foam. If you think of it like, a, and I've always said this even when it comes to reinking, like a kitchen sponge. When you have a kitchen sponge that has moisture in it, okay, water in it, it's nice and fluffy, it's regulation size, correct? Right, when you look at that kitchen sponge, it's, it's the thickness that it was spec to be, it's nice and squishy, it's nice and soft, but if you, if you leave it on the counter to dry, what's gonna happen to it? It's going to shrink, it's going to compress, compact, and it's going to become rigid. No different than an ink pad, okay? If you let your ink pads completely dry out, that material that starts out really nice and fluffy, starts to get compressed. Can you use refresher on it? Yeah, sometimes you can spray distressed refresher and that will rehydrate a water-based ink. Can you add reinker? Yes, often reinker is is a great way to do it, but think about it, reinker is not as fluid as water. So while you're putting ink in there, you're really not adding enough moisture to kind of bring it back to its spec. And if you continue to neglect reinking your pads, eventually the material, regardless of whether it's felt or foam, will become more and more compact and compressed and it doesn't matter how many times you re-ink it the ink will not absorb into the pad anymore it'll just kind of dry up on there you'll get one or two uses and then it's just done it's done holding ink is there any way to resurrect that no once you've completely dried out your pads from the inside out you have to replace them because no amount of ink or refresher is going to bring them back to life so ink pad maintenance is key. And some people believe like, oh, it's just a gimmick, you know, just there's plenty of ink in my ink pad, I use it, and when it's done, I throw it away and I buy a new one. That could be you. But really, reinkers are a great uh, investment, especially if you do minis, whether they're mini archivals or mini inks, because, I mean, just look at the size comparison of that ink pad. You're getting like one-fifth the amount of ink than you would in a standard ink pad. So you cannot expect a mini ink pad from any company to last as long as a regular ink pad that you would have. That's just... That's unrealistic, right? Because there's not that much ink in these little pads, but they're great for different colors, convenience. I'm not saying it's a one, you know, a one use wonder where you just use it and you've got to re-ink it every time. It's designed to hold ink. But keep in mind that maintenance matters and re-inkers are key for all products. If you, and when do you re-ink it? You re-ink it when it's not stamping or performing. Maybe you're using it direct on a, on a gel plate. You re-ink it when it doesn't have the color level that you expect it to be right? Some people like their inks on the wet side. Some people like them a little bit on the medium side and some for certain, you know, edging a paper, they like it more on the dry side, as long as it's not totally dried up before you decide to re-ink it. So there you go. Hopefully that answered those questions, Mario. And off we go into the demo. So first things first, <laughs> first things first, I have been wanting to do this uh, since I Got the new colors because I have my, you know, the original colors and then we've got the new colors, but I just, just give me a minute if you don't mind. Okay. Thanks. I just want to get some of this stuff in order and then it will really help me uh, demo more. Just kind of doing my own little Roy G. Biv kind of thing. It's just what I like to do. All right. You do you, you do what works for you. I just, I like to see color in a, in a specific palette or an order. And sometimes people care about that and sometimes they don't. Good, okay. 
So see, look at that, ah, oh, harmony. So now when you see uh, how it fits into general population, you can see um, really how important those new colors are as far as balancing tones that were already in there, you know? Now we've got two very different shades of pink. You know, one is more raspberry, two different shades of red. It's so nice to, to have a little bit of balance. Yellow's a funny thing. I don't do a lot of stamping with yellow. So, you know, I went with more wild honey than I did uh, mustard seed on that, but I love the shades of green, a couple of teals, you know, certainly wouldn't mind adding adding more into the, the future, but hey, I'll take what I can get. And I'm really happy with this palette. So we're gonna utilize these, okay? And I'm just gonna move these swatches out of the way because things are about to get, things are about to get real in there. Okay, so first thing we need to understand is paper, as I mentioned. You use whatever paper you wanna use. But stamping on different papers are gonna give me different effects. And because of that, I love different techniques when it comes to using archival. Is it a great stamping ink? Yes, I've already sh shared that with the swatches. You can stamp with it, have a nice day. But if you're into technique, that's where, in my opinion, archival starts to excel. Its ability to do uh, kind of some cool things that you wouldn't expect an ink to do, so to speak, all right? So I'll, I'll often try to mention the substrate that I'm working on when I do it, right? What it is, but at the end of the day, you need to try it. So if I do a technique on a certain surface and you're like, well, will it work on this? Will it work on this? My answer is gonna be try it. I probably have, and that's why I've determined to use the surface that I'm working on. But again, you do you. So this first one is going to just be uh, white heavy stock, which is an uncoated 130 pound cardstock. Could be watercolor paper, but I'm just going to do that just to talk about let's just say stamping looks, okay? And I'll just take the same stamp that I did the swatches with, just so you understand uh, how applying ink can certainly impact how you stamp something, okay? So for this one, I think I'll take a little ground espresso, and this time I'm just going to drag it, right? I'm just dragging it on there. I'm not doing uh, traditional inking, swiping here and there. You'll see why in just a second. For black, I'm gonna go straight across. This time I am dab, 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 okay? This one, and I'll talk about these lids too because I already asked Ranger about them. I mean, I think they made like such a cool, imp not the other ones were bad, but such a great improvement in the mold. Um, so like the new colors, they really fit like really snug. Not that the other ones fall off, but um, they're super snug. I'm not a fan of that but I know many people are. I, pre I prefer to be able to just kind of flip the ink pad over and have the lid fall off, but um, I know that drives people crazy. So all I'm doing is I'm just kind of swiping uh, different bits on, on the stamp. And again, when it comes to the ink, I'm just dragging different things. And I'll show you why. Because archival is oil-based, your, ah, I can't do that, your motion or movement um, of an ink pad, I'll just stamp this with purpose, right? Just press down your motion is going to be visible, okay? Meaning because it is an oil-based ink, when you put it on the stamp, it doesn't spread out the way a water-based dye would or often a solvent. A solvent uh, has that ability to meld. Think alcohol ink, right? When you put alcohol ink with alcohol ink, they just kind of meld into one another. Archival ink is a bit more temperamental, okay? So if you were just to take your ink and just kind of haphazardly put it on there, you're gonna get haphazard coloring. In this case, I happen to like it. See, I like the edges darker than the center. This I wanted consistent, so I did consistent inking. This one I kind of rubbed up and down, so I got much darker color on the edges than I did in here. And then this I just kind of swiped out, so I got like a little muddy blend. I love that because how you apply the ink to the stamp, you get what you get, okay? It doesn't all blend out. Some people may not like that, right? Some people may like, hey, when I'm stamping, I want to be able to ink however I want, and it's going to fix everything for me. That's great. Probably not going to be the ink for you then, because archival is designed to really hold its detail, which means that oil-based formulation is going to sit where it needs to sit on the stamp. So now we're going to take that same stamp, and we're going to ink it, well, properly, meaning uh, everything that I do, I'm just gonna tap instead of swipe. And even if I wanted to combine colors, if you're sticking in the same color family, that's pretty safe to do, right? As long as, you know, brown to brown will be fine. I don't know why I keep putting this one in upside down. That's twice. 
It's just, I think, what I, what I want it to be. Okay, going back and forth. And we'll take this one. And right now, this is basic stamping. So you might be looking going, technique, right. Thanks, Captain Obvious. This is no technique. I'll get there. We got to start with you understanding uh, the inks because I'll be honest, it took me quite a while um, when I first working with inks at Ranger and we were doing, you know, all sorts of education. It's like the ink is ink is ink, right? Isn't it? Isn't all permanent ink the same and all, you know, water-based ink the same? No. Okay. So we're going to take the same thing. We'll go next to that. Again, stamp with purpose. I'm just using a block. I, I'll probably, you know, maybe for some things I'll, I'll get out a platform. Okay. So there's a difference. Big difference? Well, sure. I mean, a significant difference, but is one better than the other? Not in my opinion, you know? I love the fact that I can control some blending or shading. I like the fact that I can still get some undertones by mixing different colors of archival. I like the fact that even though I put a little red there, it's not going to bleed out into it because that ink stays where it needs to stay. And because it's oil-based, I didn't have to huff on it or do any of that stuff to the stamp that we would a water-based dye because it's going to stay wetter longer. Does it stay wet indefinitely? No, it's a waterproof ink. It's going to dry. It's meant to dry. But because it's oil-based, it still gives me flexibility to do certain things that I did um, with distress ink, if you will, regular distress ink by adding colors onto a stamp. So what if you want to stamp it again? Can you spray it with water and do all that? Well, no, it's waterproof. So it's not going to it's not going to do anything, but different papers could get you more ink. So for example, this one is a, a glossy paper. Glossy is really porous. Think of it like a fruit roll up. Let's see if glossy will grab anything on here. All right. Glossy paper is, is the most porous of all papers, right? So you can see it already wants to stick to it, right? You hear that pop? That's all it's going to pull off the stamp, but still cool, right? That could be a great background because what you really need to understand is all of these are permanent, completely waterproof. So could I, could I do ink over the top of it? Yes. Could I, could I add, you know, little splatters of spray? Yes. Could I collage with this? Could I a brush collage medium over the top of it? Yes. So you can create different elements with your stamps on different papers. You could even essentially stamp on, um, say Dina's collage paper, right? That white collage paper stamp in archival and then go in and use any kind of gel medium or collage medium and that becomes translucent because these inks are acid-free, permanent, waterproof, archival. Whether it's Distress Archival, Ranger, it's all the same. It's archival ink, right? That's what it's designed to do. So let's talk about cleaning. Cleaning a stamp, everyone's gonna have their own jam, their own thing, go ahead. These, this is not a scrubber top. It's just a little felt, uh, applicator and if you scrub it well it's going to come right off so instead i just dab a little bit on there right it is kind of this see it's like this oily stuff not a fan of stamp cleaners at all but i am a fan of uh, having my stamp ready to go for another color i'm just taking a cloth i know people use uh, chamois and scrubbies and again you do you i just happen to use just my inky binky little flower sack towel clean that up and you might need to go in uh, a second or third time, depending on how you're working with this, right? You might need to do that, but you can see that that, see how that stamp has a little bit of sheen. I need to go one step further. This is just me, but I like to go in with water and you might say, well, hello, oil and water. Okay. But I'm not cleaning off archival. I'm cleaning off archival cleaner. It's still, it's still a, a cleaner that has water in it. So that water is just going to take off that extra little shine. And now the stamp, I would say like, you know, if your stamp can grip onto glass, then it's clean. Okay. If it slips, then you still have some oil on there. And the reason I like to clean this off with water is if you leave it on your stamp and some people go, Oh, it's a conditioner, right? Okay. Just imagine if every single day you put conditioner in your hair and you didn't rinse it out. Eventually it's just going to be so greasy. Uh, that's the same thing with your stamp. If you continue to put stamp cleaner, you don't rinse off that stamp cleaner. When you go to say ink a stamp with oxide or distress ink, it won't go on your stamp because there's that barrier of oil uh, that's going to, to kind of eliminate it. So it is, yeah, cleaning the cleaner. That's exactly right. I saw somebody ask about uh, archival and alcohol ink. You can use archival over alcohol ink, okay? But archival is still a solvent-based ink. It just happens to be that the solvent itself is oil-based, if you really want to get into the chemistry of it. So it's an oil-based solvent ink and alcohol inks are solvent and solvents react with solvents. 
So if you stamped first and did alcohol ink over it, the alcohol ink would eat into that archival, okay? But if you put this over the top of it, uh, you could get that to sit on top because it's an oil-based solvent uh, versus just a regular solvent. Anyway, hopefully that helps. I know it, there's a lot of playing involved, a lot of playing. Okay, so that's basic stamping. You guys see that? So far, so good, right? Nice detail, nice. I mean, that's, that's nice. If I would have actually planned this out, I could have had two pieces of paper and essentially three different card fronts because this, this is overlapping, but that's okay. It's still gonna be good for collage, okay? Is it safe to leave archival on stamps? Yes, perfectly safe. Um, I often talk about priming my stamps with black archival. I put that on there. Just know that if you're priming your stamps with archival to use with distress, you don't have to worry about it because this is permanent and waterproof. So once this is on your stamp and it dries, it is permanent and waterproof. So if I put these inks on, which are water-based, it won't re-wet this. The only time I need to clean this off is if I'm going to go into archival because archival re-wets archival. So sometimes people just only work in this area, then you don't have to worry about cleaning, right? You go back to what I've said in a bazillion videos, which is spray, go, off you go. Uh, Copic friendly, you know what? I'm not sure because I don't use Copic, so anyone that does might be able to chime in, but I don't know. I really only work with Ranger products um, specifically, so. But somebody in the chat might know if that is true or not. Okay, so knowing the basics, knowing the basics of an oil ink, what can we do with it? Well, some pretty cool stuff, actually. So first thing I'm gonna talk about is um, different papers and different things. And this is my process, okay? This is, how I, this is how I do things, how I learn things. I try, and if it doesn't work, I'm like, why didn't it work? Let me try something else, let me try something else, okay? So this is a very cool resist technique that we've been doing for a long time um, at Ranger. I mean, I think this even goes back to the Ranger U days. It's called archival resist, but sometimes people don't understand the what makes that work. So I thought if I just did a little step out just to kind of show you, that would be good, okay? So first things first, basic archival resist, okay? So what that means is working on a coated paper. So if it's coated, specialty, right? Matte, coated. Could you do this on glossy paper? You can, but remember what I just shared, glossy is the most porous paper. So if you do glossy, I don't think that the results are as good. So that, again, that's just my opinion. So for this, I'm just trying to find my little stack. There we go. This is some specialty, put that right here. Okay, so this is a matte coated paper that I did this technique on. What that involves is taking an archival color, any color you want, stamping it, and then going over it with distress ink, any color. Now, why is this working? Why is this a resist? Okay, this one happens to be evergreen bow. All right, see, love that color. So why is this working? Why am I seeing this over the top? Because this is oil-based, this is water-based, and oil and water don't mix. It's a very simple principle, but sometimes we just hear those terminology of like, oh, oil-based, okay, water-based, okay. But then we don't think of like, well, what does that mean? You know, look in the salad dressings, right? Oil and water don't mix. You have to emulsify it to get it to go together. The great thing about this is by using these two products together, it's gonna to create a cool resist. Now, before you ask, does it work with oxide? No, this is a pigment. Pigments are opaque, dyes are translucent. So if you try this technique with an oxide, the pigment covers it, covers everything. So we need to stick with dye and dye for this particular one, but pretty cool um, how it works. So here are the three different, just say, uh, tryouts, if you will. This first one, and I'll still demo it so you can see it in real time, but this is stamped, dried with a heat tool, and then covered in ink. Now you can see that it still resists, but it doesn't have the same, I don't know, like cool vibrancy, intensity as the color. So when I heat set this, I'm like, huh. I mean, it resisted, but it's not very exciting. What happened? Oh, wait a minute. I think when I heat this, I actually cooked this ink into the paper, right? It's coated, this is oil-based, but you still, when you dry with a heat tool, you're adding heat, it's gonna essentially kind of cook that in, all right? So when it came to this, I'm like, okay, well then what if I don't heat it? What if I just stamp it and go to town? That would be this one. So this one, I stamped in archival and I just started applying ink. Look around here, what happened? Well, my image was too wet 
and that archival, that oil was kind of smudging out on the outside. If you do any lifting technique, this would make sense to you that, you know, when you start rubbing over the top of this, and in this case, I brayer the ink, I was pushing that oil from archival out there. And this is pretty cool, but it's pretty messy. So I'm like, okay, wait a minute. So I can't heat dry it <laughs> and I can't do that right away. So what happens if I just stamp in archival and just let it dry? How long does it take to dry? For me, it was five minutes. How did I know if it was dry? I touched it and there was no ink, it wasn't wet, so it was dry. So I just stamped in archival, let it air dry, about, I don't know, I'm not gonna say five minutes, it probably didn't even take that long, but it was dry. And then I brayered over it and I was like, there it is, right? I didn't get the smudge and I kept the intensity. So that's going to be the technique. Coated paper, stamp in archival, let it dry, add the color. Let's just do that. And while it's doing that, I'll, I'll kind of jump in and and go back and try to answer some questions if I can. All right, I'll take this. Just gonna take a platform for this one just to give myself a little, little more stamping. Perfect, I'll put this here. I'm not gonna be totally precise. Let's see what I wanna do for stamps. We got some good stamps, right Mario? Really good. good stamps. That stuff all kind of cleaned up nice. Let's do this one, this is good. I like this one. A distressed damask, very cool. Uh, Mario's pointing a question, you don't contaminate the pad doing that, but doing what? I couldn't, I don't know, I don't know the context of that. Sorry, so if you ask that and maybe ask again, maybe I'll, I just don't know what that is. Could have been what I did before, but I don't know. Okay, so stamp, this is clean, right? even though it's pretty grungy, because I, as you guys know, I like to put black on the stance, but you can see that most of it is pretty much uh, rubber. So that's clean for me. Uh, just take some salvage patina. I like this color. I think it's gonna be uh, great. And I, I like the cushion of this. I'm gonna tap, 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 right? So when we were doing swatches, kind of the cool thing is like, you know, we were inking this up and then I just like the fact that I can just take this off you know, clean it, clean it with cleaner and then put it back on. So it is important that uh, if you want stuff consistently, you either, you know, know where that goes or just remove the lid and, and clean. All right, so tap, tap, tap. We wanna make sure that if we're gonna do this as a resist, which we are, that we make sure that we have this. There's the follow-up right. to that question. Stamping, Stamping over our cobble before it dries. Uh, nope, doesn't contaminate anything, not at all. So you'll see the technique and then you'll understand the answer to that question question before the technique. I get it. So here you'll see it. Okay. So we put that on there and stamped. So you can see right away when I talk about oil base, see how the light reflects? Okay. That's that ink sitting right on the surface. So if you were to go over it right away, you're going to get what I call like the smudge factor. Okay. That's where it's going to have uh, that smudginess around there. You might like that. It might give you like a cool burnished effect. Another great tip, um, if you can go in and just clean off your stamp just with a dry cloth right away when that archival is still wet, you can get most of it off, right? Most of that color has come off onto the towel. Can you see that little salvage patina there? And that makes it easier to clean. It's not so much, but uh, to me, that's like, that's the beauty of it, okay? So I'll just get this off, get this off, set that over here. And while that is just sitting there, just doing its thing, I'm going to talk about like moving forward. Like, okay, so what happens if? So what really sparked kind of this interest is, okay, if I'm doing this, does it only work in certain colors? Because, you know, often you'll see a demo of something. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. You know, oh, he used Evergreen Bower. He used Salvage Patina. It only works in that. This technique will work in any color of archival, but every color is going to give you a different effect or resist depending on the color itself, right? That has to do with probably the dyes, the formulation. So when I look at this, right, we've got uh, a little kitsch. I love that little barn door, right? There's some spice marmalade, little fossilized amber, cracked pistachio, beautiful colors. But over here, this was peeled paint, right? Now it's a little darker green. So it didn't give me as much of a resist as the others because the color itself is a little bit darker, but a very cool effect nonetheless on a piece of white card. And what I like about this technique is that it's really interesting because it kind of gives you that illusion of batik, right? Where you put a color, 
you put uh, embossing powder normally is the resist. You add color and then you iron it off. This is like completely smooth, but we get that resist and it will work with any color. I'll get into other colors as well. You know, I'm a fan of brown. And as I say, you do you, so I do me. I like brown because it's very dramatic. So uh, we're going to get into this one, but just know that it works with so many different colors and it's really a beautiful way that you can create this. This was done uh, with a stamp in that same damask set. It's just you know, inked it, wiped it off, inked it, wiped it off. And if you kind of work in Roy G. Biv, you have to do less cleaning, right? Because like this is pink, so I just wiped it off. If a little pink got to red, who cares? Wipe that off. A little bit got to orange, who cares? But then in this one, I cleaned it, so I got to yellow. Yellow to green, who cares, right? So you can determine, depending on the order, uh, how you want this to work, all right? So now we'll look at this. Can you see that it's not as shiny? It just has those little spots in areas. The other thing to know, oh, there's a little fuzz right there. There you go. So if the whole entire image is not shiny like before, it means it's starting to dry. This to me was good enough. Could you wait too long? I don't really know. Like I, I couldn't say that I let it dry overnight. It was just minutes and as any maker, it's just minutes. But when it comes to these little dots, will these little dots screw things up? I don't know. We're about to find out. But overall, you can see the difference that your whole image doesn't have that wet look. That's another thing when people say, how do I know if it's dry? If you didn't want those dots, right? If those dots were just like, oh gosh, what do I do? Then you might just want to wait a little bit longer, but I'm just going to go for it. So how do I apply the ink? I've tried many different ways. You can still find what works best for you. I find that applying it with a brayer has given me the best results for a couple of reasons. One, an ink blending tool is designed to apply a light amount of ink, right? So you're putting the, the, ink blending tool in there, you're going over the top and it's putting a light amount of ink and you have to keep doing that and keep doing that. And really what you're doing is you're rubbing that ink. So to me, whatever oil is sitting on the top, as soon as I go in with a blending tool, I seem to kind of blend that out really quick. And I didn't like the effect. Did it create a resist? Kind of subtle, but not nearly as, as well as a brayer. Uh, why do I like a distress brayer? Because of the, the rubber. It's like a soft, firm rubber that is designed to hold both ink and oxide, all right? So I'm going to have the brakes off, which mean these little rubber feet are up versus down, and I'm going to roll and lift, okay? So just roll and lift, coat this, and we're gonna have to go back and do this a few times. I just happened to use brown. Again, it's distress ink and not oxide. And then I'm just gonna start brayering over the top of this. What's great about a brayer, if you haven't used one over paper, is look at how easy it is to, I think, add coverage, but also how nice it blends into itself, right? So when you brayer another layer, those lines just kind of meld in. And the more you add, the more that resists to showing, right? So far, so good. So you can bring this to whatever level you want this to be. You can even embrace those, those cool little marks, which I think would be great on a card front because it almost looks like, I don't know, layers of tissue, if you will. But just brayering this over the top when you're done, flip it over put it on its feet, right? So we don't set that roller on its side because then you can get a flat spot in a, in a rubber brayer. So you set that there to clean the brayer. I'll talk about that in a second. This is what we have right now. Okay. Very, very cool resist. But if you know anything about resist, that means when something is resisted, whatever this medium is around it, some of it is sitting on top. So it's always important to do like one final step, if you will. And this, I'm just taking a paper towel. Could you use a regular cloth? Yes. Uh, but this one happens to just be, I like Viva paper towel for this because it's just soft. And I'm just burnishing just to make sure that I get any of that excess. You can see there's not much, probably hardly not any, barely change the color of this because that paper soaks everything in. So this is done. This is dry. This is absolutely beautiful detail, such a cool resist, right? And I love how depending on how much of that archival is sitting there, you get such a, an amazing effect on there, okay? Now this paper, specialty stamping, is incredibly sensitive to water, okay? I'll show you this effect. I mean, super sensitive. So if you've ever watched any demos and you've seen, you know, where I flick and splatter water, okay, yeah, we've seen it on mixed media, we've seen it on watercolor, but on specialty, incredibly sensitive. So I'm just gonna take water, I'm just gonna splatter some water on there, Go in with, you could take the same paper towel or it could be whatever. And I'm just going to absorb that water. Boom, look at that. So not only does it go down to its white core, but look at how it just brightens that color. 
So essentially you could say, well, hold on, you know, could I go in and, and wipe this with water? Yes, but wherever, if the water hits the brown, it's gonna take it off just the same. So another trick, if you wanted to kind of take this um, even a little bit lighter, you could essentially take this. I'm gonna try this. I've not done this before. In my head, I think it's gonna work, but I'll tell you in a second if it will, right? Just like what we said before, right, Mario? This is how it works. I'm going to try it. I think I was pretty good. Let's just see. I'm just going to see if I just missed a little bit of water on that stamp. Not a ton, just a little bit. And if I stamp that in water, oh, hot dog. Yep. So you can see that I was actually able to get some of that brown off even more and brighten that up. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I was wondering if I can do that. Now I know. So I just missed it with water and just kept stamping. I didn't wipe or anything, and it just lifted off a little bit more of that brown to make that even brighter. Just cool, pretty fun, a, a fun thing when it comes to the basics of archival versus a water-based ink like Distress. Cleaning a brayer is really simple. Uh, this one is designed where you can just grab the roller, push up from the feet, and rinse it off, right? So. I'll just go in with a little bit of water. You could brayer it off on something, right? If you're a journaler, mixed media, you know, clean your brayer on, you know, on a journal page or something. But if you just wanted to clean it that way, the handle is designed to, to bend apart to remove that, okay? So this one's just a stamping. And I've been doing this and I love the idea, but I thought, what if, okay? What would happen if I didn't want to apply a brayer? Maybe I am into uh, journaling, mixed media, and I want to do something other than an ink pad. Would it work with sprays? Well, I needed to test that out. And this is the effect, the same effect with sprays. To me, I mean magic, come on. This is cool, don't get me wrong, but this, what is this going on, right? What is that weird little halo and the drippage? I am having that. So this is the same technique, right? Archival ink stamped, not dried with a heat tool, but instead of brayering my ink, I used a spray stain. Now, spray stain, again, just like the same rules with uh, Distress Ink and Oxide, could you use an Oxide spray? No, it needs to be ink with ink, but a spray stain is very cool because it resists on contact. So I'll demo that. But before I do, I needed to say like, okay. So this I knew worked, but as curiosity would have me, I've only ever done this on coated paper. Be honest, when we taught this back in the day, it, was always, it used to actually be on glossy paper. Uh, that's because we didn't have specialty stamping. We didn't have that at all. So I thought, well, I don't, I guess I've never really tried it on white paper. And to be honest, you know, in doing this since 2004, we've had a lot of different papers. And like I said, different papers do different things. I'm like, so what would happen if I tried this on just an uncoated paper, white, heavy stock? Well, there's my result, magic. This is archival on heavy stock with a spray. And I got a very cool effect. This is speckled egg, you can see that color. And so I thought, okay, well then it has nothing to do with archival, it must be the paper. So let me just stamp in Distress Ink. Well, it's something. I mean, I see the image, but it didn't resist. It just kind of got darker. So this spray technique, that allowed me to kind of open the doors because brayering on a on an uncoated paper is not fun. You guys, if you try to brayer on just like dry paper that's not coated, you see like every line, every mark of a brayer. So that's why I like to spray. So let's play around with that and see what happens, okay? Take a piece of specialty. Let's take another stamp. Ooh, this is a biggie. I don't know if I even have a block this big. Oh, I think I do. All right, let's, wowza. I love one of these, very dramatic, right? Dramatic flourish. Let's do, let's do something like that. Okay, I think for this one, let's go into, I think I'll do kitsch. It could be pink, why not? It should be. Or maybe I'm just gonna play, All right? Tap, tap, tap. And I'm not gonna do the entire thing. I'm just gonna have it kind of feather out here or there. Okay, a little kitsch flamingo will be good. Let's place this over here. I'm gonna flip this around, stamp it off the edge. Again, stamp with purpose. That just means you want pressure, so you want your fingertips to change colors. Uh, you don't wanna do CPR, because that's going to uh, often make your stamp not only move, but flatten the actual detail of that. 
So there we go. So this is what I was saying about the fade. Like I love an image that fades out. You don't, then ink it up uh, proper from top to bottom. Let's clean this off. Okay. That's good enough. Now, same rules apply. We're going to let that dry. And while that dries, we're going to do another demo of archival. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, Tim, I love to use oxide, right? I like to do a lot of blending with oxide. I like to do a lot of backgrounds with oxide. Uh, what's the best ink to stamp over oxide? Well, over oxide, any guesses? Archival, oil-based. It's going to sit on top of anything you put it on, from inks to paper. So, what, is it okay to get archival? I just did, and I just it wipes right off. So, yes. Yeah, the same archival is not going to, you can clean archival off anything with archival cleaner. And if you take it off when it's wet, you saw with a dry towel, it just comes right off. So perfect timing for that question. All right, so this one's just a, a quick one. This happens to be Mod Cactus, just to show you a comparison of, of how the inks can work on, on different substrates, okay? So let me take, we're gonna go to uncoated now. This is just heavy stock, just to show basic stamping, because maybe it's a tag, maybe it's a, a journal page. I would say it's pretty similar. Same things are going to apply. I'm gonna take a solid of that cactus and an outline. It's a fun set because you get a solid and you get like a scribbly detail of the same cactus. Quite fun. Let me find a little block over here. All right, let's take this guy, right? This is the, the blobular, the background. So I'm going to take Distress Oxide this color is shabby shutters because you don't have to do matchy-matchy with this. In fact, you don't want to do matchy-matchy because, well, it's going to match. We want something that's going to provide some contrast. So here I'm tapping that on. You can see that the oxide is giving nice coverage to the stamp. So I'll stamp the solid. Nice. Kind of looks like a face. All right. I'm going to ink that up again because I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison. Again, this is uncoated just so you can see the difference. Now, when I do comparisons and show you the difference, it is not about right and wrong. It's not about, oh, do this, don't do this. It's just, hey, this is what has worked for me and this isn't, okay? So oxide, water-based, what did I clean it with? Water, water-based, water, oil-based, water. Oil oil-based cleaner, right? So just a little bit of water, clean that right off. That's easy. Then we're gonna take the detail, the scribbly part of the stamp and we're going to stamp over it. I'm gonna use the same color. In this case, it's going to be crushed olive because I wanted a little bit darker green than the oxide. And I'll take Distress Ink and that same color in Distress Archival, right? Just so you can see, so you can see the difference. I mean, really fair is fair. So we're gonna start with Distress Ink. We'll ink this up, really give it some, give it a good inking. All right, There's a lot of little lines, but we want to tap, 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 get some ink on there. And we're just going to eyeball it. You know, the cool thing about this set, it was designed to be off register, right? So that's kind of the cool effect of that off register design. Not bad. Gave me a, a nice impression as it should. The thing about um, working with, I'm just going to wipe that off. Same damp paper towel is going to be fine. Um, the thing to know about this is that when you first stamp a dye ink, it's always going to look nice, but you'll see as it starts to dry, right? You can already see inside here, it's gonna to start to fade away in those areas because water-based and water-based, they like each other, right? They get together like, hey, let's hang out. And then they just kind of get together and you'll still see a lot of the outside detail, but this inside will start to fade. So if you wanted to stamp over an, an oxide, and, and this is just stamp to stamp, you could be doing this over an entire background, but if you want your image to, to stand out, you'll just see the difference. You might like the regular ink over archival. Again, you, you need to do what's gonna work best for uh, ultimately what you want to get out of that. But there's the difference, right? So same color, it's just because this is oil-based, it's going to stamp with more intensity because more color sits on the surface than something water-based, which will essentially soak in and dry and you can really notice the lines on top right that these really have started to kind of fade and if you did any other type of blending or spraying that it's going to it's going to do that but this this is really going to always sit on the surface and give you the best detail so whether you're stamping in black because you're doing text or whether you just want to do some images uh, in a collage or a journal and you want that image to be in the foreground right in front of 
any of your oxides that you may have done in the background, archival is going to be a great choice for stamping. And that's really why we want it in colors, right? So do I do a lot of that? No, that's why really I don't mind having minis of the colors of archival because how I use archival is very specialized really to me. That's why I said in this demo, if you understand the product, you know, most people just go, I don't ever need to stamp in a permanent pink ink or whatever. Okay, maybe not. But if you're trying to do some different techniques, it's going to be great that you have different colors to create a resist or to layer on top of. But traditionally, if I'm doing a sentiment or something bold on a card, yeah, I, I go to black. I, of course I do. And that, that's really why I think, I mean, I know Zoe and uh, Paul, the rest of the makers will kind of talk about how many years, years we're talking, that we asked Ranger to please do black soot archival in a big ink pad, even though they had jet black, right? And I do this demo all the time, but to me, seeing is believing always, right? Always. Don't get me wrong. Jet black is a great black ink. So I don't want you to think that, oh, look at him. He's dissing this color. No, this is a, a very nice black ink. If you're stamping, I mean, I'll even really give it a double dose, right? It's a nice black ink if you're doing stamping, but compared to black soot, Black soot is just a different color black, right? It has no other undertones, no blues, no purples, no nothing. So when it came to stamping, especially because I stamped so much on brown, let's be honest, I really needed the blackest ink on there to show up, okay? And of course, I was re-inking this little black ink pad crazy. I mean, I've even done videos where I've tried to make a DIY ink pad and uh, Zoe and everyone, they'll attest like, it's not the same when you make your own ink pad. It's not like filled the same. It doesn't have the same even, but I'm happy that we released these uh, last year. They did come in a stack where you get like uh, the black, the gray, and the two browns, nice colors, right? The set, these colors are available in the big, but that's it. The rest of them are minis and they'll stay that way. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And hopefully you kind of understand why that sometimes you just want a little color, but I've even given this time because I didn't want you to think it was like smoke and mirrors to see that that has not changed at all, right? Archival, what you see is what you get. This, it's pretty much done its thing, but clearly the lines inside are not nearly as intense as the outer lines. Nothing right or wrong about that, just something cool and different, all right? So now let's get back to that. See, it's like a little, it's like a little demo within a demo, right? While this is drying, demo something else. Multitasking, that's what we need to do. Okay, so we have this one here. We're gonna do some spray. So let me get my splat box, because this is only part one. That's why I said tomorrow I'm a little, a little concerned with, uh, with time overall, because, um, you know, it's like two product launches in one. Hey, it's Saturday. You got time. Everyone's got time. All right. All right. Saturday demo. Because really, this is kind of two separate releases. I mean, we put them together, obviously, for logistics. I mean, everyone knows uh, in this day, it's just, it's a challenge for manufacturers, retailers, everyone to just get products. So... Whenever they can consolidate shipping, that's what we do, okay? Oh, good, I'm glad, Cindy. Like that comparison, that's what I really try to do. Sometimes it just takes seeing that to be like, I get it. Because you can hear oil-based, solvent-based, water-based all day long, but seeing it is like, I get that, I get that. All right, so I just put a little paper towel down. Do you have to put one in there? No, but if you have one, it just kind of absorbs. If you're a journaler, put your journal in there, right? Diane taught me that, like, I don't do an art journal, but. It's a great way to catch a lot of mediums. I'm just gonna do a paper towel. Again, archival, not heat dry, just air dry. We're gonna spray over the top of it. For drama, I'm going to use brown because, well, I like that. I'll actually throw something else in. Maybe I'll do a little ice spruce as well. Both of these are spray stains, okay? Let's spray this right over the top. And you can see immediately what's happening, right? You don't need to kind of uh, get the whole uh, wait, I need to wait and see. You see right away it's going to it's going to resist. But it does some really kind of cool things as it's sitting there drying. It's the drying part that I think intrigued me the most when I was playing around with this technique, right? So once that's there, if I want to like mix some colors, I can throw a little bit of water, but at this point I don't want to do too much because this is a coated paper after all, you guys. If you're if you're not used to working with coated, tread lightly at first, right? Understand that because if you're used to spraying a tag or watercolor paper, it's pretty much when you do it, what happens? That ink soaks right in. Look at how much ink is still on the surface, quite a bit. So the other reason I love a splat box is that I can hold this handle and I can see what I'm doing. 
I know there's people that make their own splat box and guys, I'm not trying to sell you a cardboard box, okay? But this is why I wanted the splat box. I could pick it up, I can dry it, I can see what's going on because it doesn't have four walls uh, and it also allows me to, to create an angle, right? If everything is down and everything comes from the top, everything pretty much covers everything else. And by this, it just kind of gives me that whole area to spray. That's just why. I think sometimes, again, you don't, you don't fully maybe get its features to, to see if it's even worthwhile. So I'm using a heat tool just to start drying that, but now I'm gonna go in with some water and I'm just gonna start splattering this, okay? Already you can see that that archival, see how it's just pushing everything away from it? I didn't do that, it's doing it. It's something about this paper that's pushing that movement, that motion of pushing it out, it's really cool. These little dots that are happening, that's happening from the water right now. So I'm gonna kinda do simultaneous, right? I've got a little heat tool, got a little spray, just make sure you don't put one into the other and you'll be fine. So when the water comes out, heat tool goes away, a little splash. So I wanna do that because if you just spray, it's going to essentially wash away everything. And maybe you wanna do that. You know, maybe you wanna get rid of some of that uh, color somewhere. So let's talk about that. Maybe you have some color, see on the edge, how that ink builds up. If you wanna get rid of some of that color, you can, nothing wrong with that. Let's get just a, a dry paper towel or a cloth. We can press, press that ink off. It's not gonna, it's going to lift the color, but it's certainly not going to, to take away from the effect. Like, look at what's going on here. Oh boy, that's good. Okay, but you see that shine? You still have ink. So let me explain this part of the sprays. Okay, and maybe this is one of those techniques where those that make their own spray could like really understand it. Okay, when spray inks came out and I mean, Di, Diane, Dilution, she'd been doing spray inks forever, right? But a lot of people assume that a spray ink is just taking like a reinker and adding water to it. And it isn't, it's its own formulation. It has to live in that bottle. It has to do its own thing. Um, and yes, before we had spray inks, I mean, back in the Carol Duvall days, I was taking reinkers, putting them in water and making, you know, sprayable color, but they didn't do what the ink pad itself did. And that's what's great about having a spray stain or an ink spray uh, or a gloss spray like Dina has her own. They're all formulated different. Come on, focus, there we go. They're formulated different. These have a resin in there. And this technique is totally gonna point that out. You see that shine? You can see that the rest of this is dry. You can see how much I've cooked it, but the resin in that spray, especially in the areas where it's concentrated. So you don't see it in the light areas, but where it's really dark, that's where the resin has kind of, all the colorant has dried, but the resin is still, still sitting there going, mm, what do I do? I, I have nowhere to go. You could keep drying it, but you could dry it for an hour and that resin is not going to dry completely. So once I dry this and I feel that I've dried pretty much everything I could and I'm still seeing those little, those little shines, I like to just go in again with a paper towel, just dry and I'll try to dab off as much as I can. We can get, we can get rid of the splat box for now. I'll bring that back in a second, all right? But this will allow me just to go in and try to lift off some of that resin. See, there's not much color coming off. Like you would think, oh, he's gonna touch that, like all oh, the brown is gonna come off. No, we're really dealing with like resin to come off of that paper. And then I'll even go with my fingers and just kind of soften that up. And that pretty much does it, right? There's, nothing, there's no ink that's going to come off. Then I can go in and just finish drying it, okay? So that, to me, that just kind of, I don't know, that just kind of settles it out. Now I wanted to do the lightest color just so you can see that light colors with dark colors are absolutely stunning and beautiful because this is a background. A background is a background. You want something that's going to have some interest, but imagine just doing a die cut in black perspective butterfly over the top or a stamp sentiment in black and do embossing. It's really gonna show up on here because all of this action is smooth, fluid, a beautiful background. We don't have embossing powder, we don't have this, and I'm gonna get into glaze and what we talk about, but this is what's so cool about archival is that we have the ability to create very cool effects on coded. And of course, you know, once I started, I couldn't stop. I'm like, okay, well, what if I did a bunch of colors? Well, no problem. So here I just took a stamp and I inked a bunch of different colors, you know, with the ink pads, cause they're mini. It was a nice thing. Let's see, where's that stamp that you did, Mario? Oh, I'll get it. 
right there, right? Take a, a background stamp of roses, ink up just little parts with your ink pads. So I started with pink, did a little green here. I went in with a little bit, I like olive. I think that crushed olive is just a cool color. Stamped it out again on white, did the same technique I did here. Stamped it, let it dry, did some lighter colors, little ice spruce mixed with some antique linen, but I like it. It's a, a very cool background. Great that you could cut up, great that you could do collage. And this could be lighter than you want. So let me just explain that. Because we've worked with a water-based ink over here, okay, water-based, that remember the stains are water-based, that even though we dried it and we did the heat setting, we could still manipulate this a little bit more. Can you say what paper you're using? Everyone has missed it. Okay, it's Distress Specialty Stamping Paper. Thank you. Yes, that when I say coated paper for this whole demo, this is the paper that I'm using as coated paper, Distress Specialty Stamping. It's a matte coated paper, and that's what makes it cool. All right, so here, we've got the color. This is dry, this, this background was already done, but what if I wanted this to go lighter? Watch what's going on. Um, the other cool thing about a spot box, I can, I can angle that up, and I'm just gonna start spraying this with water. Just hosed it with water. So what's happening? Well, it's going to start reacting the color in the background, but still that archival will forever be permanent waterproof, okay? Doesn't matter how many times you go over it, it's still gonna be permanent waterproof. Spray that, let's give it a little dry. You'll see, okay? So this was strictly water over that same background and you can see already how it lightened the color. That's another great thing about this particular paper. Because of its matte coating, it almost gives such a, like a suede kind of chalk finish. Uh, if you wanted more color to come out than just what water alone did, remember from the beginning with the splatters, so could we add some water direct? Could we go in with a paper towel direct and, and literally pull some of that off? Yes, absolutely. See, if I'm doing that, it's pulling out even, even more color, but it will never impact the archival. So now this background just became even more pale, more shabby. So that's the thing to remember, even if you're doing ink sprays, if you don't like how intense the color is, you can always go back and lift some of that color, right? To your liking. I love just, it's so, it looks so textured, doesn't it? But it isn't, it's completely smooth. Fantastic, okay. Then of course I had to play with a stamp that I've been wanting a long time and I know Diane, if Diane's watching still, she'll appreciate this. Um, Cause one of my recent uh, fabric collections, uh, it's called Worn Croc. And I'm like, okay, so I've done this with like a, a pattern stamp or I've done it with an image. What if I just wanted a texture? Because you know that as a, as a maker, like background stamps are my jam. I know some people look at them and they don't understand it. Like this is pure magic, like marble, right? or lace or doily, you've got a cool crackle, splatter, grid, but this one, this whole croc look. I stamped it in archival. My color was frayed burlap because, well, this is the color of my dreams. I love frayed burlap. And look at this background. Shut up. What? Sill white specialty stamping paper, right? Stamped in burlap will there be a white archival no white is a pigment not a dye and archival is a dye ink so uh, no you'll have to get the lightest maybe antique linen or pumice so frayed burlap that was a really nice cool light beige color stamped with the crock see you can see it in there and then i just went in with my sprays so what did i do for my sprays well little pumice stone little forest moss nice deep dark and just a little splattering of some walnut stain but Come on, right? That is such a cool, and no texture, that's the thing. So it's very interesting to see what we can do with stamps and archival and spray. That's what I was saying about the demo, that sometimes a product, much like people, are misunderstood, right? You, you see something and you assume it's one way, but you really haven't fully opened your eyes to understand all that it can be, right? And seeing using archival just as basic stamping. So if you're a stamper, you don't need to do any other magic, but the fact that you can control your imagery with an ink, that's cool to me, right? Everything from texture. The fact that I can create resist, that's really cool in all different colors with a brayer and do that, or doing a resist with spray or doing a resist even on uncoated. Now, of course the resist can't be the same level, but it works nonetheless, just playing around. 
And then of course, just understanding its purpose in the stamp world, right? Not just a regular image, but over other inks. But when it starts coming to like building up technique, it really allows you to use so many different things in new ways. Using your sprays with a texture, this would often be like a stencil or doing embossing and iron it out. This is literally a stamp, letting that stamp air dry, because that to me provides the best resist, and then going in with your colors and then just drying it. In some areas you can see how I just kept splattering water. Like this one probably took about, I don't know, 15 minutes because I just kept, you know, splattering a little water here and lifting it. So it kind of faded out and really focusing uh, some of that heat in there to get that intense color, but pretty spectacular for a flat piece of paper. That is the beauty of archival. In, in my opinion, that is what makes archival magic. Can you stamp and emboss with archival? That's another cool thing to know about archival because it's oil-based. You can use embossing, but it is not the same as embossing ink. It is not a glycerin-based ink. So your open time for pouring your embossing powder on is not the same as it would be for embossing ink. But on different papers, you can stamp with archival, cover it with clear powder, and get a nice shine with, with archival. But your open time in your paper really is different. And so with that, let's kind of move into uh, glaze, if, if we will. I think that's good. Hopefully I answered questions about archival. That is my, that is my goal. Like I said, whether you like it or don't like it, or, you know, have no interest in these kind of techniques, or you're happy with your stamping ink, that is wonderful. But understanding what makes archival cool and why we want it in different colors to create different effects. Well, that to me is, is super, super magic to me. The, the fact that we can achieve this with literally stamp pads and sprays or stamp pads and ink pads. I mean, that's, that's the unbelievable part is that there is no texture. You can see, I'll continue to do it. It's like every time I bring it up, like you want to touch it because you expect it to have a texture. Okay. So this one, just to wrap it up and I'll get into glaze. This is just to answer the question where people say, well, wait a minute. So if I stamp in archival and I spray ink over the top, it's going to act as a resist. This is, this is just white heavy stock, uncoated paper. Yes. Okay. So does that mean I can't stamp on top? No, go back to the, the very beginning of, of the demo where it's like oil-based will sit on top of something. This is exactly the same color ink. This is evergreen bow. This was stamped on white paper sprayed with brown, right? So it acted as a resist, kind of got a, a little dingier because this is the uncoated paper. It's not as vibrant, right? Once it dried, I stamped the same color on top of the brown. And you can see that evergreen bow still has that color property, even though it's a translucent dye, of course it's gonna, it's gonna change tonality depending on what it's sitting on, but because it's oil-based, you still appreciate the color even on a brown background. So that's a, just another thing. And sometimes just sitting there, playing around with these things are just cool, cool to do. All right. Oop. Oh, we don't wanna put swatches in the trash, do we? Not that quick. Not these, just no. cool. <laughs> exactly. Okay, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm just trying to set up for glaze. So far, so good. All right, everything, Mario, so far? So really good. Do a, just that whole crock thing. Okay, well, you know, I always have to just take it to the, the next and the next and the next. Of course you do. I do. Okay. That's how you figure stuff out. That is, that's how you figure it out. So glaze, well, I already put my glaze into, because I couldn't wait on the glaze. I already put them into its palette. <laughs> and then this is what happened, right? Um, these are the, the Distress Storage Tin, also known as the Crayon Tin, but uh, we initially did it for crayons, but because I use it for everything else, it's been like renamed as the Storage Tin. But Distress Storage Tin, Distress Crayon Tin, it's the same tin. You know in my demos I use it for all sorts of things, even down to, you know, how I store my backgrounds, and I just love this size with the window. But when I filled it up, it's like there's now 24 uh, colors of glades. And I know there's some new distress colors that's still coming out. We still have uh, five, I think, to go in the new distress colors. So I know we're going to get more, but it's like uh, uh, we need to fill this tin, Ranger. So hopefully down the road we can add a few more colors of glaze just to round this out, you know, to a nice 36. But I do like seeing uh, these in there. I also love uh, working with the, the team at Ranger, Taylor, who does graphics. We always try to do uh, things a little bit different. So you can see on these new colors, we've updated the labels. Um, my old eyes, like I can't see anymore. Um, so uh, we'll do running changes on all these, but like, I love the new label because I can see the color, right? 
So because this, I'm like, I don't really know. I have to hold it up and be like, oh, okay, crackling campfire. So it is nice to, to see that. But the glaze, what's going to be really fun about playing with the glaze, and you can see like when I work with my tins, I always like to put one in the other because it kind of creates a little palette. Some people would want it the other way angled, but I'm not bothered by that. But if I'm working with my stuff, normally this would be like on the side, but I, I like having my, my products out to work with. The fact that this is a translucent embossing powder allows for a lot of very cool things. So let's understand what does translucent mean, okay? And this is not just to, to talk down or sound dumb, but sometimes those words you think in your brain, okay, I think translucent, isn't that like see-through? Yes, it is. Um, but in embossing powder, there are see-through embossing powders out on the market, okay? So most of the time with embossing powders, the color on the jar is not gonna tell you whether it's see-through or not. So you could essentially have a red embossing powder from a company that is opaque, and you could have an, a red embossing powder either from a different company or sometimes even the same company uh, that's maybe a different name, but it is a translucent red. And it rarely does it call it out on the jar that this is an opaque powder or a translucent powder. And that was the inspiration with this whole line. I didn't invent embossing powder. It's not, it's not that it's never been done before. It was just dedicating an entire line to only doing translucent colors, okay? And what that means is normally when we do embossing powders, these are Ranger embossing powders. They're great, they have great colors. They're opaque, meaning when you put them on a card, they're going to emboss beautifully and they're gonna cover the background. You probably want an opaque powder if you're stamping a sentiment on something or you're stamping an element you want in the foreground because it doesn't matter what your background is, an opaque embossing powder is going to cover up whatever's there and you're just gonna get the color. Distress embossing glaze, they're translucent. So you could have similar colors, but because we can see through them, we get to really play off of the background. We get every little bit of grunge and splatter. This is cool for, well, mixed media effects, textured effects, background images, stencils, a great way that we can add a little bit of shine, texture, and color, but still build from our background instead of cover. So is there a right or wrong? No way, I have, I mean, I have a bazillion embossing powders, really, everything from metallic to, to sparkle to textures to, I mean, there's so many cool different powders even out on the market, you know? Um, even like mixed media powders, Seth After powders, there's so many ways that you can use this as a texture, but it's just understanding, like, what are these? A glaze, it's just translucent, like a glazed donut. You can see through that and you get some color. What do I like to do with them? Well, a lot of things, to be honest. Okay, we're gonna take the most basic thing and then we'll go into more uh, the advanced. When you work with these glazes, it allows you to use a color over an image, whether that is a collage, whether that is a stamp, whether that is journaling, whatever that happens to be. So this is just a text stamp that was stamped in black on just regular cardstock. This is white heavy stock. So this could be any kind of paper, tag, whatever. And then that is the glaze color. So these show you the new six glaze colors and just how vibrant and wonderful they are. They're really bold, they're nice, but you can still do things to them. And you'll see, we can still dinge these down. So if you're not a fan of bright colors, uh, don't check out on these yet because you can get some grunginess with it. But how you apply these really depends on your medium. And as I mentioned, you can emboss with archival. Heck, you can emboss with regular distress ink in the right uh, environment, circumstances, uh, surface. But Traditionally, when we do embossing powders, we work with an embossing ink, and it could be Versamark, a lot of people use that, or it could be anything that says like embossing ink. Um, distress embossing ink, the reason I like that is because it's not as gooey as traditional embossing inks. It's not as sticky as certain embossing inks. It, to me, it's like the perfect one. Does it mean it's the one that makes these work better? No, it's just my preference in formulation that I like an embossing ink that's not sticky, and I like one that's not really greasy. I don't like a glycerin-y, uh, greasy ink. So this comes in a pad, it comes in a dabber, and it comes in pens, right? Brush and bullet, so you can use it for uh, touch-ups on a stamped image, right? If you stamp it and you kind of miss a spot, you can use it for journaling. Uh, but often I'll use the dabber for, for big areas, for large areas, so like these swatches, the image was stamped in black, swipe over it, emboss. So can you stamp on top of glaze? Well, of course, you could stamp on top of glaze the same way you could stamp on top of any embossing powder, but that ink would either need to be archival, which is gonna take some time to dry because you're essentially stamping oil on top of plastic because embossing powder is plastic, or something like Stazon would work on top, or you can often emboss on top of embossing, okay? It just depends. Um, 
but I like to work with glaze. The specialty is working like from bottom up because having that color of glaze uh, kind of highlight that image is really cool to me. So that's kind of the basics and we're going to get into some technique. All right, first one, I think the first one I'll do is this because we're gonna let it dry and then I'll jump around just like I did with the other ones. So even though I just spoke of embossing inks, okay? Embossing inks are not the only thing you can use your embossing powders on and whether that's gonna be glaze or anything else. Essentially anything wet is what's going to allow the powder to stick to, to allow you to emboss it, okay? We use these inks specifically with stamps, right? Often uh, direct to paper. But what about texture? There's a lot of cool texture mediums. Maybe it's a texture paste crackle. Maybe it's texture paste matte. That's just kind of that uh, white fluffy stuff or grit paste, right? Grit paste comes in uh, opaque and translucent. This one dries see-through. These are different textures, but these are very cool for using with glaze because we can add a whole different level of dimension to the top right? Much chunkier or thicker than just putting the powder itself, right? You get shine, but you don't get any, you don't get much texture. This is paste through a stencil. So this is like molten glass. And the cool thing about glaze and having colors is that we can take those colors and mimic our background, right? And I'll, I'll talk about how this is, how this is done. So even down to something like specific as a floral, we can color an image just with powder if we want to, okay? If you do crackle, this is a cool thing that Stacy shared. It's awesome that we can put glaze on the crackle paste, let it dry, because I'll go through the demo and talk about that. And then when it dries and the paste crackles, heat emboss the glaze so now it looks like shattered ceramic. Like a whole nother way to take glaze beyond the stamp. So there again, sometimes people only associate embossing powder with stamping. They're like, I don't do much stamping and embossing. I don't need a glaze. Okay. But do you use stencils and paste and all that? Oh, yeah, 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 of course I do. Well, here's a whole nother way to, to take opaque and translucent paste and give them a whole different color, texture, and finish. So here's the basics, okay? Here are the basics. If we're going to work with, um, I'll just start with regular matte, okay? Just to, just to show you, just kind of something fluffy. Fluffy. I'll take, for this, I'll just take a tag. Just for now. I'll probably go into a background first, but just so you can see what I'm talking about and the principles, and then we'll get into uh, getting some prepped. You can take a stencil, whatever kind of stencil you want to work with, and place it down. Not gonna not gonna be too super particular with tape or anything on this one, because again, it's just a demo to show like how this works. Yeah. Take some paste on the bottom of a palette knife. This is a Distress palette knife, it's just plastic. This one happens to be texture paste matte. So this is going to be uh, textured, but it's going to dry with a, an opaque matte finish. I like to just start by pushing some of that down through the stencil like that, see from the bottom of the knife, and then move it around with the corner. So press, skim, press, skim. And you just push that through, right? Just add some of this. This is just an unfinished Tag, meaning plain, basic, nothing on it yet, but we can, we can get there. And just going through this one, I happen to like just random uh, stencils, okay? I still have all that extra paste. Scrape that off to put it back in the jar. It's a brand new jar, but normally you can, uh, I like to put a little press and seal over the top and that's good. So we're gonna lift off the stencil. It's all about the dismount, clean it. I put it in a little tray of water. I half off, off on the side. That's how I clean my stencils, just let it sit in water. And then we have this. So again, I gotta move some stuff out of the way. That's how it really works when it comes to demo. Let me just take the box. I still like to use a splat box even for embossing powder, okay? Just because I don't like my table to feel like sand on the beach. I have a piece of scrap paper underneath. It's gonna be fine. Let's just take some colors. We have a, a pretty good amount of time, right? Uh, but for this, if I just wanted to add some color over the entire thing, I can do that. That's what I'll, I think I'll just do that. Just pour some on, be generous. If it's just one color, just be generous with it, right? Move that around, get that covered. So I'm, I'm moving it around because I even wanna get the sides of texture paste, right? Texture paste, it has texture. So it's gonna have uh, the top and it's also gonna have the side. So I wanna move that around. Then I'll just tap that off and there you go. So now our powder is stuck to the paste. So what makes these techniques work, meaning what I'm gonna show you with all of the different paste, is that you put the paste on, and while the paste is wet, 
you apply your glaze and let it dry. This paste underneath needs to dry because if we were to heat emboss it right now, that paste is gonna bubble up and burst over the top of our glaze. You might like that, but it's a pretty messy looking uh, finish. So we're gonna let it dry. How long does it take to dry? I don't know, depends on where you live, depends on your climate, your temperature. Uh, I'm, I would say at least 15 minutes, okay? Could be longer, but it just depends. And we're just gonna pour that extra powder back in. Any excess, I'm just gonna just shake it off into the trash can. But then essentially most of the excess powder at this point is, is in the splat box. And I often use a splat box even for embossing. It's totally up to you, okay? But what if we wanna create something colorful? I st I'll still use that, so, okay. What if we wanna create something a little bit more colorful? Let's start with the background then. So I've done this with a lot of different things, pretty cool, okay? Like this is one, look at that, for Valentine's Day. Grit paste, right, with a little kitsch flamingo, sprinkled on a little bit of that new picked raspberry. Mm -mm -mm. This is translucent grit paste over an inky background, but see how those hearts have all those different colors? Because we can mix colors of glaze. So having kitsch was great, but having that little deep picked raspberry, and you can see a little bit of barn door there, hello. That's beautiful, right? So I just, I just play around. So let's find a background <laughs> that we want to use. Mario's like, please stop. Okay. Um, well, okay, this one's kind of rainbowy. That's good. You could do something maybe a little on the grungy side. It doesn't have to be big or small. That's good. These are just ink backgrounds. One is watercolor paper. One is, well, it looks like mixed media. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's embossable, you can do that. But yeah, not a good one. It looks like glass. They look just like ceramic hearts sitting on the top. Totally different. Okay, uh, let's put this in. Oh, I could do this over paint. So you can do it over ink, paint, really, whatever your background is, it, it doesn't matter. Um, for this one, we'll do crackle on this one. So I think it has a nice little vintage vibe. How about that? Um, which one do I wanna do crackle? I think I'll do the, oh, I, I'm gonna use this one. Cause I, I've demoed this a lot. You can see from those previous ones, but it's nice because it gives me, no, I'm gonna change my mind. I'm gonna do this one. Okay, I'm gonna go here. There you go, get it together, Holtz. We're gonna take crackle paste this time. We're gonna open this one up. I'm gonna open it off camera. I feel some crumbly on the lid. There we go, All right? See those little crumbly flakes? Don't, don't put that over your work surface. Get some of that off. Because who didn't put press and seal on the jar? That would be me. And that's why I got the crumblies. Okay, I'll do it after this one. Sometimes I forget. All right, so crackle paste, you can see is much wetter than the other one. That's okay, it's still gonna do the same thing that we want it to do. So I'm gonna move this off because I kinda need to have it, everything, all systems go for this. I'm gonna place this down. Okay, because this one's a little bit wetter, um, that's probably why I didn't put the press and seal on because I don't mind if this gets a little thicker as long as it doesn't dry up. You just wanna make sure that when you move it around, just don't be so aggressive with it because you could essentially press it where you know, maybe you don't want this to go. But that's okay because we're gonna cover this with glaze. So same rules, I can scrape off any excess that I might want. I'm going to take this, it's all about the dismount. So I'm holding onto this while I lift this up so I don't slide it across the background because we want to peel that off, goes in the water. There you go, little lasagna pan of water. Put the lid on this paste real quick. Excellent. This I can just wipe off, just with that paper towel. Okay, and off we go, whoop. All right. It's like I need six hands over here, it seems. It's kind of crazy. Spaces, well, you know, I try to keep everything in camera so people see what I'm using if they, if they look away or if they're typing away. So here you can see right away that that is wanting to start absorbing some of the color from the background. That's what paste is essentially going to do. But what I'm gonna do for the glaze is just add some cool elements to it. So I'll take some brown. That's good. I probably should have chosen my colors first, but I can wing it right now. It'd be good. We've been doing probably a little bit of, yeah, let's do a little bit of speckled egg. So I've got some browns, some teals, essentially some of the colors that I have here. And I'm just gonna take these, the lids off the jars, just to get some colors. There we go. You guys see that okay? Perfect, okay. I like to start with the, the brightest color. I'm gonna go in that area and I'm just, it's in between my fingers right now. So if you have pork chop fingers, this is good, right? Remember in the last demo, use your pudge parts. All right, the parts that are pudgy sometimes make the great, greatest tools. So I'm just gonna twist some of that color. All right, I'm not dumping it on there, just twisting it in, in between my fingers, just to get some color. Going with a little, it's all about the twist. You don't wanna open this like a, 
like a bulldozer because it's just going to it's going to dump everything down. And again, just twist and just kind of follow wherever you want a little bit of color. The other goal of this is try not to cover or or have the intention of covering the entire image with powder at this point. We'll get there, right? But I think sometimes when you're doing this, you see all that uh, exposed area and you're like, oh, no, 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 I need I need to get some more. I need some more color on there. Uh, not necessarily. Not, not yet. You can always go back and add more if you need to. All right. So for this technique, just so you know, once you've taken this out of the jar and you've used it, it's now a party mix because you can't separate these. OK, so we're going to take this and we're going to just do that little finger tap. So I'm just taking my fingers and I'm just doing a little dance under there. You see how the powder right there? See how it's just kind of vibrating and working its way off of the surface. If I were to pick this up and dump it all off initially, whatever excess color I had could essentially cover up everything. But by doing this, it's bouncing the color essentially in that area and filling that in. So can you see down here where there's no, there's no powder? This is what I was saying. This is where you can go back and still add some of that. As long as the paste is wet, there's no reason that you can't go back and cover that. So same thing, just do a little dance. All right, there's your party mix. Could you save that in a jar? Absolutely. What are we gonna do with this? Let this dry as well. So now we've got all those cool colors. This is over crackle. We're gonna let it crack. Perfect. And we're gonna place these. Put the lids back on. I'll put them in color order later because I might take something out. I'll probably still, I'll probably still want to use that. Hmm? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna get rid of this. Again, if you have a party mix jar, go for it, right? It kind of gets a little muddy, but it could be fun. All right, let's take, where's that other background? Here we go. Let's take this one, because now we're talking. Now we got colors, a colorful background. So let's utilize some of those colors that we have. That new wild honey, mm, that's gonna be so good. That little twisted citron, so good. Little broken china, so good. And I think I kept out some salvage patina. Yeah, nice little, Nice little rainbow, right? We'll even throw in a little bit of wilted violet because we can. So these are gonna be all of our colors. I'm gonna put them off to the side. I'm just trying to make room, you guys. I'm sorry. Okay, excellent. So I'm just gonna get these uh, ready ahead of time. Just kind of do the whole rainbow order. Like everything else, when I'm doing this, because I know when I'm demoing it, it seems like you know, chaos, because it is. I'm trying to, to show you stuff essentially start to finish. But usually, if I'm, if I'm getting on my powders, I'm doing this to many different backgrounds, right? Because maybe I've already had my background play day, and now it's time to add some texture to things. So maybe I'll try crackle or grit or whatever and have my glazes out. So often, I think as makers, we watch a demo or a tutorial, we're like, oh, Gosh, so much stuff to get out, so so much hassle. It is if you're only doing it for one card, but that's why the whole uh, compartmental creativity comes into play. Do backgrounds for a couple hours. You'll, you'll be so much more productive doing that than doing one thing start to finish. I guarantee that, all right? So now we're going to go to grit paste, but I'm gonna do the, come on, focus, translucent grit paste uh, versus the opaque because I want to be able to see through not only the glaze, but see through my texture. The other two that we have already done, those are both opaque. So all we're gonna see is the glaze. We're not gonna see the background. This, I wanna see both. That's why I'm choosing a translucent grit paste versus opaque because grit paste comes both ways, all right? I'm just gonna clean off my palette knife just to make sure I don't have any, any opaque stuff on it, okay? We're gonna scoop some of this up. This stuff is weird. Grit paste is weird and I will say that uh, grit paste, it has a shelf life, meaning if you don't use it for a while, uh, you can try to rehydrate some with a little bit of water and, and keep it keep it nice. But once it dries up, it's very hard to reconstitute it. Um, but it starts to get pretty crumbly and, and that's by design, that's okay. Uh, this one, this is pretty new, so it's still wet. I actually like it when it gets a little bit drier. It's just, to me, it's easier to manage, but uh, that's all right, we're still gonna make it work. I got a stencil down. Normally I'd work on my media mat, but I'm not going anywhere. I don't have any room for that. So I'll just take this, spread this through uh, those areas. And heck, for this one, I might just use uh, the whole stencil. It's just a background, so I know I'm gonna cut this apart. Might be uh, die cut, it might be one card, it might be a bunch of different ones. So look at the stencil. I don't know if you can see, I can't really pick this up. But grit paste is really funny. If you overwork grit paste, 
it wants to start grabbing onto itself and start pulling away from the paper. So you kind of have to work fairly quickly with this stuff and change your direction because if you keep going over the same area, it'll just start pulling it off when it's, when it's dries. It's interesting. I don't mind it. I mean, I like that, but for this, I'm trying to get something to stick to it. The other rule of thumb, whenever you're doing texture through a stencil, if you can't see your stencil, you have too much stuff on there. You still need to be able to see your stencil underneath. If you don't, you have way too much medium. And when you lift your stencil, everything is going to collapse. Okay. Meaning all your texture is going to fold in uh, the negative space. So put the lid on that grit paste again, I'm going to hold the stencil in one area, lift this up so I can pull, you know, lift that right up. Nice dismount, put that in the, put that in the water. Okay. This is what I have, all right? Cool, wet. looks like it's opaque. It's going to dry translucent. So not to worry. And so now what I'm going to do is try to be matchy matchy. I'm going to try to go in with color on color. So in the pink area, I'm going to go in with my pinks. And I can be fairly generous in this area because, you know, I want some of that color to, to really show through. If you don't have color, it's just going to be translucent underneath and that's okay. But I'm just following essentially the, the pattern of, of my background. Okay. That's all I need to do. Now we'll go into some yellows, all right? Nice. Love that bit of, of wild honey. I might even do a little fossilized amber over there because I can. I can go back to some pink if I want to make that blend. Take a little bit of kitsch if I want to soften that. It's just really fun. It's just, it's painting with powders. I don't know. It reminds me at the, the county fair when you take all the sand and you got to make that crazy little bird out of a Coke bottle. Maybe nobody else did that, but I certainly remember that as a kid. I thought that was the coolest thing, right? It had that little, what was it, like a golf tea nose thing or I, I don't know. What? It was just the coolest thing ever. Okay. Kind of. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I want to do that. Okay. A little bit touch of twisted citron. Then I'm going to go in with some salvage patina over here. Cause that's where my, my blues are a little bit of mermaid lagoon where it's deeper, right? See, I use a lot of that. So I have to turn that just so my, my pork chop fingers can kind of fit in there. All right. Nice. And we can still see a lot of translucency. That's okay. And now I'm just going to take a little bit of that wilted violet, uh, put that right in there. Okay. I, think I want to just lighten this uh, a little bit on the edge. So I'll go back right in with that. Okay. Here's what we've got. So we have a background, a lot of colors, colors that pretty much mimic the background. And then we're going to just do, do the dance, right? So this dance, you can still move your paper because what, what I'm doing is really looking at the powder and the way it's jumping and, and the directions. And I want to make sure that, you know, obviously I keep the green out of the pink, the pink out of the green. So as you're dancing, just kind of turn your paper until it's done. And look at that. It's like all those blends, magic. Whoop, whoop. Okay, we're going to let that one dry too. Okay, three pieces drying. This party mix could be the same jar, could be something different. But we're going to let those dry. And while those are drying, we're going to get into other glaze techniques. <laughs> Talk about that. And then we'll come back to, uh, to cooking those, right? I won't forget. Hopefully I won't forget. You won't let me forget. So, let forget. so that's good. All right. So I've you shared. On You're good. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to work with powders. They're open and here we go. We're going to, we're going to use what we have. Um, I've shared a lot of different techniques of how we can use glaze with uh, die cuts and embossing specifically. They can certainly add a whole nother level to embossing, right? So it's like embossing on embossing. We use an embossing folder. This one happens to just be a multi-level, right? Just on craft, believe it or not. It's just craft paper. Oh, I got a little bit of yellow glaze in my finger now. There we go, that's better. Um, this is just craft. So this didn't start a, a, as craft stock. It was brown paper. My color, that, that background color that you see is glaze, right? Salvage patina glaze. It creates a beautiful effect. Once the glaze is on there, this brighter color, this patina, if you will, is distressed crayon because the crayon gets into all the, those little pits that the embossing enamel does and creates the most incredible background. It looks like metal, but it's really just a piece of paper. And I've taken that technique uh, many different ways. This was really the first time I played with it just on a tag just to see if it worked. And then it was like, just back up, right? So these are impresslets. These are uh, those little folders that emboss and die cut. So now you can essentially make paper embellishments out of just white cardstock. The color 
is just the glaze. So these do not have any inks on them at all. Every different color you see is a glaze, right? That's your coloring. That's the cool thing about this technique is that you create such beautiful embellishments. If you're not into the brown grunge, you would simply substitute white crayon for brown, right? I use brown, but if you wanted shabby chic, white would do the same thing, just like this light blue. I think this might've been tumbled glass crayon. Uh, so your color is what's gonna give you the vintage look. But here we've got that cool clover, uh, some wonderful trims. There's the heart that uh, I did before, right? When we had, we had fired brick, but take a look. Whoop, whoop, look at that. Little picked raspberry. Now, if you ever use an impresslet and you have, and your paper cracks, right? Sometimes it cracks on this one. Look at what that did. I've tried to replicate a cracked piece of paper. I've yet to like, there's pretty much a, a bag of hearts now guys. And look, not a crack to be found. Doesn't that tick you off, right? You don't want it to happen, right? So you're like, oh dang. And then when you see how cool that is, and I tried to crease it, it doesn't do the same, but man, I couldn't get one, but I loved that. So that's picked raspberry with a little bit of uh, salvage patina around there, right? Paper trims, these are cool. Also in presslets, but how great is that to put on a card or a box or something that really looks like uh, embossed enamel trim? It's really neat. So I'll show you how that works. I've done this many, many times. You can be as particular as far as color, right? You can do that same little technique with pinching color or just do uh, the whole thing. A couple different ways that we can, we can achieve that effect, all right? So I start out with uh, an embossed piece of paper. What kind of paper? Whatever you want. Sometimes, I know they are cool, Sherry. She's like, the cracks are cool. I know, see, like I got that, that was it. I'm like, seriously? So I've tried with heavy stock. To me, the white heavy stock, oh, this is a good, I didn't even notice this one. Look, there's a little crackage. So white heavy stock, the smoother stuff, I found kind of has a tendency to crack because it's super smooth. Whereas embossing, or the uh, watercolor cardstock, watercolor cardstock, doesn't it doesn't crack but that's okay either one here's a butterfly impresslet or there's a, a nice little scroll let's do that let's do this little cracky one and let's do a butterfly so again when i'm getting out my impresslets in my paper am i only doing one no get a sheet of paper if that's all you want to do it i don't i don't think you have to spend an hour doing anything you do but if you're getting out something do more than one even if it's one sheet of paper which is what this was chopped up at least I have a bag of stuff now that when I want to create an embellishment, I don't have to get the paper, get the machine, do the thing. Like it's just easier. It really is. And you know, little, little bags or little tins, whatever it is, like the stuff is there. Okay. So how can we apply it? Well, we could do a couple of different things. The first one, um, maybe we want to have a little bit more control. If I want control over the color, I'm going to use the pens. Now the pen has a brush tip uh, and a bullet tip. The bullet tip, it's like a felt when I mean, it says bullet tip. So it's not a, a fine detail rider, but it's fine point enough to fill in the blanks. Um, and the brush tip, well, it's just, it's a brush tip. It's kind of flexible. So it allows you almost like a, a paintbrush. That being said, if you didn't have pens, could you take a dabber, pounce that out and paint this on? Heck yeah, you can, right? You do whatever's gonna work for you. But for this, I think I will go in and just, just show that bright pick raspberry again. So I'm just gonna take the pen, go right over that surface and just color the heart, okay? And I'll change directions because you can't see it, it's clear. So you're just, you're hoping for the best, but who cares because you'll see this technique. We actually wanna put some on and take some off, okay? That's the thing to remember. Yeah, sometimes people get caught up in like, oh, I don't have everything. Well, but you have something, so you can probably adapt what you have to what you, what you ultimately wanna do. All right, I'm gonna just take some of this, sprinkle this on, you could dump that on if you want, but I'm gonna, you know, I got all my powders out, so I might as well just mix my colors because we can, all right? So pink with pink, all right? So then this one, just gonna cover this, all right? Make sure that that's covered with the pen. And once this is off, here's the thing about this particular technique. In order to create something worn, we have to take off some of this powder. So that's what I was saying is like, if you have areas that didn't get covered, bonus, okay? But if everything covered, you need to go in and wear some of this off, whether that's flicking it off or whether that's just taking your finger uh, and wear off some of that powder. So you can see the cardstock underneath. It doesn't have to be totally like, you know, make a little circle, make a little dot, because it'll look like that. But rub some of that powder off so you can see some of the cardstock underneath. Again, party mix, okay? 
Now you have an option here. One, you can emboss this and move on to the next color. I find that a little bit easier because um, if I'm trying to do powder on powder, I might touch this again and just make a hot mess. So, you know, you need to do ultimately what's going to work. This little thing, I'm just gonna use a clothespin right now because that's really all I have just to hold on to it. I don't wanna cook my fingers and I'm going to use an embossing gun now, right? Uh, the Ranger heat tool is great for a lot of things. Embossing is not one of them in my opinion. So I'm just gonna use an embossing gun. I love this one. I have it on high. Now notice I'm holding this off of my table. When you emboss, you want heat to go through your surface, not flat on it. Uh, it's, one, it takes too long to emboss, and two, you'll, only, you'll usually get it to curl. So the glaze is already done. I mean, it embosses like in a second. It's just so fast uh, with that tool. Done. I didn't burn myself, so I had that little thing. Set that down. Now we're gonna go in and add our second color. So our second color, we wanna go around the edge. Uh, I'll take my pen again, let me go back to the brush. And I think for this one, I will do a little patinaed edge. I think that could be really nice. Um, it does say embossing, Kate, you're right. It will emboss, but it won't emboss as quick as that was. It'll emboss probably in about mm, maybe 10 minutes or so. So you can use it to emboss, it just takes longer. And that's what I was saying is, as makers, you have to have preference. So if you don't mind, you know, you have a little bit more time for things to emboss, absolutely, the craft tool will emboss. I just don't like to wait. I like it to be just done. So an embossing gun for embossing. Same thing like I don't like to dry ink with an embossing gun because it just fries my ink. It doesn't, it doesn't like dispense the heat the way the, the Ranger tool does. So a little bit of everything. All right, I got some pen on there. We'll take a little bit of this. Nice, just put a little bit of that, that blue around the edge. I think that's just a, a great color. I might even throw in just a little bit of bright. I'm not, I don't want to do too much. Okay. And we're going to shake this off as well. So you can see it didn't stick where it's embossed. That's good. All right. But you can see that it, it only hit the high points because of the embossing in the pen. So I don't really have to do any removal because I can see white paper under there. Okay. I'm still going to use this. It doesn't matter. I can just grab a probably a section if I need to. And off we go. Still gonna emboss this. You should see Mario behind the scenes. He's like, it's like, I don't know, it's like in a kitchen, right? I just turn around and hand this and yeah, kind of keeps me going. Here, you need this. Here, let me take this. Thanks, Mario. Cause you wonder like, where does it go? Does he just turn around and yeah, it goes right into Mario's hands. Just like, here you go. Okay. So I just want to make sure that's embossed. It is. Take that off. All right. So here's what we have at this point. We have a glazed heart and this is glazed and this is glazed. This, this shine of this is a little bit more subtle because there's not as much. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to do this one next. I'll probably stick to, I don't know. Let's see, what color do I want to do? This one, I'm just going to do a dabber and just go over the whole thing because I think it would be, be fun to do like this. So I'm just swiping over the whole thing, probably hitting mostly the high points. It might get in a little bit, uh, the low point. The dabber is very thick, so um, I like to just leave it upside down when I'm going to use it because it's, it's, a, it's a thick ink and it doesn't really, it's not super fluid, so it's not gonna dispense out right away. Hmm. And for this one, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this for... No, I'm not going to do it. I, I, <laughs> that's how I roll. No, I'm not going to do it. I, but listen, I was going to embrace the rainbow. I'm like, I've already done one rainbow in this. Like, sorry, too bad. Like, I can't. I can't do it. But I'm just going to throw some, uh, some blues and browns and greens. I have to go to my happy place occasionally as well, right? Now, I will say I do have a grunge party mix jar of blues and browns. Uh, often I, I have a little bit of that because I like to create rust with it. So if you like, hey, why isn't he doing the pinch? It's so wasteful because this will go in the party mix um, of, of what I call kind of the rusty stuff. It usually has like a little bit of rusty hinge and some blues and some greens. Uh, this way, if I'm ever doing anything grungy, that mix is pretty dang cool. So I think it's also uh, whatever it is that you, you like to do.
All right. So same rules are going to apply. Let me just pick this up. My splat box is, I don't know where it is. I think it's, it's right here. Oh, it's behind me it? somewhere. No, I'm good. Thank okay. you. All right. So I flicked this off, but I've also kind of mushed some of this around, right? I'm just using my fingers to wear off some of that stuff from the high points. Can you guys see that? See some of that paper coming through? Really, really important to remember that. Yeah, that's, I'll just show you like when this mixes up, what a cool mix it is. See, that's a good mix right there. If you're into the grime and grunge, that's a good one. Okay, emboss. Just gonna do a little heat embossing on this. There we go. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people are looking for impresslets. All of all of my impresslets uh, with Sizzix, they've all been retired. So if you see them out there, they're gone and there are no more. I have not designed any more impresslets. So there's no new ones coming. That's it. Um, they were all inspired by vintage things. I love them. So yeah, the butterfly, the heart, the wings, all the trims I just shared with you. Yeah, they're they're gone. I mean, they might still be in, in certain stores, but just know like they're not coming back, not even from a vault. Uh, they're done. So see how fast that gun is? I mean, it's like zippity do, right? So there you go. That's what we have. We have that shiny enamel thing. And these are okay. You know, you could look at this and go, oh, yeah, those actually look pretty good. I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I think that they can get a little bit grungier, which is what we're going to do. So let me hand these off to Mario. Yeah, Here. Here, you want to take that box? I'll yeah, set them sure. in there. Thanks. Because things are about to get messy. You can just look at the lid and there's like some powder residue okay. for matchy matchy. I got you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. See that? Talked about this before too. Powder on my mat, not my friend. So I'll take a Swiffer. It's a great way to get powder and glitter off of a mat. And I'll just put it in the trash. Oof. That trash is heavy. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay, there we go, a little clean. So here we are. So once these are embossed, what is the trick to making them, well, grungy? As I mentioned, the trick really is um, crayon, distress crayon. So whatever colors you wanna do, I'm just going to use brown. But I like to have uh, not only a distress crayon, but a distress blending brush, okay? Uh, the reason is I want something that's going to be somewhat compact, but also somewhat flexible. Meaning uh, when this is open, you're gonna get that flexibility. When I slide this forward, I'm gonna be able to get that compact area to push this around. So that's really what I like about this brush. And that's how I put the color. But if you have another way or a different kind of brush, use what you have, but I do have one dedicated to crayon, right? Can you clean this? Yes, you could just clean it with soap and water, but I just have a dedicated brush because I do this technique to a lot of things from, from paper to obviously impresslets. This is just a walnut stain distressed crayon. You're going to carefully apply that color. See that? We're going to add a little bit of water to a craft mat, not to the actual surface because these are water reactive. So could I smudge this? Yes. But if I use my finger to smudge, I'm essentially flattening the embossing. I don't want to do that. That's why I prefer to use a brush. Get a little bit of water on there. You can see it just reacts even what's there. And I start with just the brush itself. Really work in the bulk of that brown around. So I'm just moving this, I'm just using the crayon that was there, right? And just moving it around by, by twisting and moving. If I want to concentrate some color, cause maybe it's not getting into a certain area, I just slide this brush forward. That, that isolates those and see now I can really work that brown into those flowers with the brush. Okay, so far so good. That's one, I'll set it aside. We're not done with it. And we'll do the same uh, to the butterfly. So again, start with the crayon. Carefully apply. You can always add more, but no sense in wasting it. Dab a little water, start big, really work that color in, All right? We want to just, we want that brown to go where it can go. Just using the brush itself. And if the crayon's not moving, you see this little globular right there? Okay, that's the crayon not moving. So I can just add a little bit more water, then I can go in with the brush and I can just work out that there you go. See my body globular, it's gone. So remember that it's water reactive and you're still working on paper. So don't get overly aggressive with what you're doing. Sometimes people feel that things are indestructible. They're not. So when you're done, 
slide this all the way up. That covers the bristles. There's a little bumpity bit there and a little bumpity bit there. So the lid goes over that, that goes into that, and you're good to go. Okay. So now we have these and you look at these and be like, Ooh, man, I liked it before. Maybe you did. And maybe you even like it this way, but I like to take it one step to, to go from dull because the crayon did in fact dull the entire thing and it could be finished. If you like it, leave it. But this, that's what I like. That's what I'm going for. A little, little mix of grunge and shabby. Okay. So to do that, because they're water reactive, you saw what was happening here. Water is going to react this. So I'll just take a paper towel, a little bit of water on there. You don't need a lot. Okay. And we're just going to go in and do the reveal. Meaning look at that, just a little damp paper cloth. It could be a towel, it could be anything, but it, you want it to be paper because you want it to absorb that. We're just going to start wiping away some of that grunge and look at what we're getting. Ooh -hoo, right? So if you didn't want this to be as grungy, you would have just wanted more glaze because the point of this technique is wherever there is glaze, it will resist the crayon. So that little area that you saw me wear out with my finger, it revealed the paper, correct? So that paper is not sealed. So that allowed the crayon to seep into the paper. So depending on how you want this to look, if you don't want it as grungy, then you would just have more glaze. So you could even go in like on this one, you would go in with maybe the dabber or even a paintbrush to ensure that uh, ink went into those little flowers, which would of course uh, hold more glaze. But see, this is, that's my happy. And like that little crack, hello. Okay, so this one, this one looks pretty, pretty brown, pretty bad. Uh, the other thing to know on this technique is you always need to start with a clean part of your paper towel, because if not, you're essentially painting brown over this. And sometimes on a larger surface like this, I'll do one side. Look at that. Oh my heck. See that guys? Oh man. So good. That side not done, that side done. See? Yum. But this is already brown. So if I, if I did the same side, it would just kind of muddy it up. It wouldn't remove it. Now, could you go back and add more crayon? Yes. Could you go back and add more glaze? Not really. Uh, it's already done. It's already in there. What, what's happened has happened. But you can go back. So if you take off too much, you can uh, add more. But take a look at that. I mean, how spectacular is it? It's a piece of paper. That's amazing. On a journal, uh, in a, even in a frame, you know, because these could be if you had like a, a shaping kit, you can sculpt these. I mean, it's just, it's pretty fantastic to be able to create this with embossing powder. What makes it so significant? glaze. The fact that it is translucent is what's allowing these to blend. If you've ever tried to use multiple colors of embossing powder, right? And you sprinkle multiple colors, you get that whole speckly fleckly look because different colors will stay different colors if the powders are opaque. Meaning if you have red and green and blue and you do that, it's going to look all speckled because they are opaque. But when these melt, even though the green, see how the green just goes right into the blue? the orange goes right into the green. Translucent colors, as soon as they melt and become liquid, they just, they meld beautifully. Look fantastic, so cool. That's why I just like to sit and just make a bucket of paper things because, well, it's cool, it's fun to do. All right, so let's go back to our textured things, see if they're ready, and if not, I'll move on to the next thing and uh, we'll see when they are ready, okay? No, I'm just gonna look at, I have to look at them. Okay, I'm gonna just look at them, thanks. Mm, yeah, that one still has to stay a little bit. That one's not done yet. That needs like, needs to sit on a cooker. It won't. Okay. Um, uh, no, it's fine. Okay. So these, I would probably, I'll be honest, I would give these a little bit more time to dry. Okay. But yeah, I'm not going to just because I want to keep this thing going. We're already in it okay. because we can. Okay. And uh, so here's another trick. So how did I know just from looking at it? Um, if you feel the bottom of your paper, and your paper feels cool, cold, um, that tells me that the paste is still not, it might be dry on the top. Like if you touch it, it'd be like, oh, it kind of feels dry. But if you touch it now, the powder could come off. But the fact that the bottom is cold, then that means that the paste is still wet underneath. A couple of tricks. I mean, you know, I don't want to get you into all this cookery, but the sun, that's obviously a good thing. Um, but even something warm, a hot plate, or if you have like a heater on, you know, something just to add warmth that's not an embossing gun would be good, right? So that's kind of like an electric skillet we could No, you wouldn't want that. That's too hot. But just something warm uh, obviously helps stuff dry uh, even quicker, okay? So now we've got our texture paste, matte, and we have 
our glaze. So we're gonna emboss it. Again, I'm holding this off of the table because I want my heat to go through the paper. By allowing heat to go through, it also eliminates curling. You know, sometimes you emboss a card and it curls up like a Frito. That's just because if you hold it flat and you heat it, heat has to rise and essentially it makes your paper curl. But by doing this, it allows the heat to go through your paper. You get less curling. Okay, see that little bubbly bit? There you go. That's because the paste is still wet, but that's okay. Oh, look at that. Woo! It's blistering. It's gonna be pretty cool for this one. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> that's fun. Okay. What we don't want to do. Okay. I kind of like it for this one. Yeah, I know I'm, all the grunge lovers are going to be like, seriously, a molten, look at that. Yeah, they kind of settle down a little bit, but sometimes they'll cool like that. But that is what happens if you do um, a little bit of, like, too, too quickly, but that's okay. If you, this is your jam, go for it. This would be great for Halloween, for sure. A little blistery background. Mm -mm. Okay, I'm just making sure that's done. Excellent. Okay. So yeah, you can put it on anything. Yeah, if you're, I saw someone like, put it on the top of the dryer. Yeah, if you're doing laundry, put it on that. There we go. I'm good with that. I'm good with those bubbles, but it is what it is. You know, see, and you see how the bubbles are white? That's what I was saying is the medium is like actually coming up through into the glaze, but this one's gonna be cool. So here's the benefit of, of texture and glaze is that we get a very cool, significant texture. We get that raised element, but now our design is completely plastic, meaning it's going to resist anything. It's going to resist uh, oxide. It would resist paint, but you'd have to wipe off the top, obviously. Um, it would resist ink blending, and it's going to resist sprays. And I'll do sprays because sprays uh, are ultimately the quickest way to create a background. So I'll just show you that. So this, once it's cool, and it stays flexible and pliable. So sometimes people uh, really uh, are like misunderstand again, uh, textures. Not all textures are flexible. Some texture paste do dry, crunchy and brittle, but the Ranger uh, texture paste, like all of the Distress, they are all flexible, including the glaze. So this would still allow me to die cut this, right? If I did the background, could I go in and, and dry it that way? Yeah, you could, you could die cut it and then dry your inks. It's not going to crack this stuff off at all. Okay, let's go and add some color. So real quick on my backgrounds, I'm just gonna use what I have, which essentially are some blues, greens, and browns, but that's okay. It's going to work for this one. Um, yeah, I think I'll get it to work. Just gonna add a little bit of water first because I want my colors to move. I'll start with some, some spray, just put some color down. If you, if you start with brown, just be careful. All right, don't, don't get too crazy. Ooh, a little crushed, nice. A little forest moss, nice. All right. Perfect, a little grunge over there. Hey Mario, let's see. You mind grabbing me some colors? I don't think my mic cord will go too far. I'm gonna get some other colors. Let's see, I'll, I'll take a tour. Can you grab some spray stains, just like a bright blue? Uh, maybe a Mermaid Lagoon or just anything bright in the spray stain and maybe a, an orange campfire rusty hinge. Just because I think seeing the contrast of this is going to be even, even best. So I think that's going to be good. Uh, Okay, that'll work. And then just a little orange, please. Thanks. I might, I would get it, but my mic cord won't go. Uh, spiced is great. This is a little salty ocean. So that's a cool little bright blue. And then I'm throwing a little orange, just so you can see, uh, just by throwing in that. So see, it just adds a little bit of warmth. I just thought everything looked too, too cool. All right, so here's what we've got with our sprays. Real nice. Okay, so once this is on here, here's what we need to remember. Remember when I talked about uh, embossing and heat tools and people, I'm going to a heat tool. Why? I don't want to emboss this. If I use an embossing gun to dry my ink, it's going to cook that color into the embossing glaze. I don't want that. I just want to dry my background. So that's the benefit of a heat tool. Would it emboss that powder? Yes, eventually, but it's not going to do it right now. So this is going to allow me to dry the ink. It's going to allow me to throw some water spots on there like I do in my background. And right now you can see all of that ink is beaded up on the glaze. It's not going anywhere. It's just there right now. And I'm not worrying about taking it off because if I touch it with a paper towel now, it's gonna pull off the color behind it. I don't want that. I might want it right there, but I certainly don't want it over the entire tag. So once I have most of the colors dry, now I can go in uh, with a paper towel, just something porous. 
which I think is good. And I'll just start dabbing this off. This is where all those drips are going to come off of the glaze because the ink won't dry on the glaze. You could cook it into the glaze if you used a, a, an embossing gun, but I'm, I'm going for a resist. That's ultimately what I want. So now that the bulk is off, I'll finish the drying. I might even do a little bit more uh, splattering. We can do ink blending, so many things. All right. But see, you always just need that little bit of something because you want your eye to do a dance, I always think. Your creative eye should just be the dance of imagination. You want to see it and you want it to go everywhere. You don't want it to focus on one or just get bored and look away. All right. So take again, a little paper towel, put that over the top, peel this away. That's just going to take off any of the water. And this is what we have so far. Again, I love it. It's really cool. But we could take it as many different directions as we want. Could you go in essentially with uh, an ink blending tool or an ink blending brush? Yes. Could you go in with some crayon? Like here, I'm just going to take whatever's left on there. I'm going to go around some of these elements, right? So first thing you're going to see is exactly what we did uh, in the last one. It's going to go over the top, right? See that brown's covering the top, but it's also giving a cool little uh, like drop shadow behind some, some things. So you can always take one idea and apply it to the next. So just like we did on those impresslets, little damp towel, and just wipe some of that off, right? But see how it just added a little bit more depth behind there? So you can go in and just keep playing and playing with this, and it's just a background. Can you stamp on this? Well, no, not really, because the texture is so high that your stamp is only gonna hit the highest points. You might do that for like text or numbers, but this is more for uh, a cool piece that you're going to die cut or maybe put a die cut on top of or maybe an ideology element. So that is just regular paste, right? That's the cool effect that it gives. Let's see these others and see how far we got on these. All right, they certainly are. Thanks, Mario. You're welcome. I don't know what he did, some sort of probably kitchen wizardry, <laughs> right? Something in the kitchen to warm these up, but um, yeah, we got that. There's a little, so you can see here, let me see if the camera's gonna focus. Maybe you can't, because I can barely see it, but the paste has started to crackle, okay? So once the paste has crackled, we're just gonna see what we get. And you can do this over an inked background or plain background. It really doesn't matter. Ah, yes, it has. Wonderful. I love this gun too. I love how you can hold it. I uh, just, really cool. Took a, took a little getting used to it first, but man, once I, Hey, come back. Once I did it, really, really cool. So this one, I'm just kind of tipping it to the light. I want to make sure that the glaze is melted and you'll see over that crack. Wow, wow, wow. So good, okay. So here we go. So this, look at that. Can you guys see it now? See the, the shatter, that crackle? So now this is cracked, but Again, we can go in and do what we did before. If you want to highlight crackles ever, you want to go in uh, with a color. Yeah. Cindy, I'm glad too. Uh, Heidi at Simon Says sent it to me because, uh, because she's kind of like that. Because she she Mario kept, <laughs> Mario had to keep cooling off the gun in the middle of the demo. And I, I didn't know what I didn't know about that. I, I mean, I read a lot about that heat tool, but I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, I think it might be too much, but it's really like the perfect one. So this one, because I'm going in with crayon, I want to make sure that I just kind of follow the embossed area. Otherwise I could risk making the rest of the background too muddy, but I prefer crayon over ink for this because ink is going to be unpredictable, right? If you didn't ink your background, well then go for it. But because I already have a background and I'm trying to get some color into the cracks, if I went and sprayed ink or did ink blending, it's going to be a little fluid and it's gonna go everywhere. Crayon, I think, is just much more controllable. Uh, it's pigment, so I know it's gonna set in where I want it to set in, and I just, I prefer to use crayon for that. But I've seen people do uh, inks and, you know, sprays, whatever they want. Again, damp cloth, just to wipe over the surface, again. And now you're going to see some beautiful crackage. Okay. Hello, look at that. How cool is that? I mean, look at that. It's like turquoise, just that, those little shattery lines. That's the cool thing about crackle paste and glaze. And to me, 
Um, and this isn't for everyone, but I, I really love kind of mimicking the background color. So it's not just one thing over the top because, you know, of course that is like, okay, yeah, you put something over the top, that's a color. But when you start playing around with different tonalities into your background, and you also end up with just magic color combos, right? When you're, when you're doing pistachios, mixing with a little speckled, mixing with a little vintage, like all of those colors really add to the depth of a background. But that crackle, that's everything right there, see? And again, totally flexible, totally pliable, uh, just very, very cool. I love that. Yeah, I learned that technique from Stacy when she did. I'm like, I mean, I did it with paste, but I didn't think it would crack. I just assumed that if you put it over there, the powder would like fill in the cracks. You know what I mean? Uh, but it didn't. So thanks, Stacy. That was really a, it's one of my favorites because the effect is so, so unique and so cool. But then of course, that idea got me thinking about other paste and then, you know, led us to this. So remember this one, this was the translucent grit paste with the matchy colors. Let's see what's going on. Can you use the brush on ink after you use it? Oh, I already answered that. All right. So now we're gonna heat this and we're going to emboss it. So these are a little, little thicker, so take your time. Grit paste is a different animal than texture. So just give it some time. Ooh, it's not, not totally. Grit paste is never supposed to be heat embossed ever, period warm or cool so just remember that it will bubble up even though it's dry but those bubbles will they'll pop unlike texture paste because this is clear but if you read the jar and i'm only saying this you know just to because it's on the jar it says do not heat and you really should not heat it's not meant to heat because it what's in it's going to bubble whether the paste is wet or dry so just know if you're doing this technique with grit the bubbles you get perfectly normal but they will they'll kind of burst and you're you don't lose your grittiness but this is one that's going to blister even if you let it dry for overnight. Ooh, I'm loving this. Okay. Just making sure that everything is melted again. And notice when I'm embossing, right? If you can just move your paper, try to keep your hand stationary. Um, I find that by doing that, I don't burn myself. As often, I mean, you know, as makers, we're fascinated by things that melt or things that do a reaction. You know, and a lot of times when you're embossing, you kind of move your gun towards your hand and then you burn yourself. So if you just kind of remember just to keep the piece moving, you're going to be okay. All right. I'm going to give this a quick little tap, let it cool. All right. Yeah, sure on loving this rainbow. Yes, really good. Would it bubble less if you heat from the back? It would not. No, not on this one. But you see how the bubbles just go away? They're not there. This is just from the grit. So as this cools, you're just left with the grit. Even though it blisters, it doesn't, it doesn't blister like this one. See how those actually pop up? Just grit paste, it just gets kind of molten-y. I mean, you could emboss from the back, but I, I think that when you emboss from the top, you're actually melting the plastic on the surface. And sometimes when you heat from the bottom, because it's such a slow process, if you overheat embossing powder of any kind, it becomes so liquid that it soaks right in. So this I just love because it literally looks like glass. And you could argue and say, well, hold on, couldn't I just do clear and let it dry? Yes, but it's not gonna highlight it the way the glaze is, right? The glaze is really almost magnifying the color in the background. That's why I love this effect. And obviously the texture, I mean, grit paste is super, super chunky and gritty and it just looks like glass. I love awesome bubble wrap. <laughs> yeah, um, it would be, but you can see like when you do a different design, I mean, see how stunning that is just from a, a glass perspective, just has a, a great, great aesthetic because it's not completely smooth, like a, a gloss paste. So those are glazes over textures, right? So we've seen just glaze over paper right? Whether we're using it for a stamp, you can certainly use it for embossing, but just know it's going to be see-through, makes a great resist. We've used it over an Impresslet, and then there's one other thing that's going to be really easy to share, and then uh, we'll see if there's any other questions that I left, which is understanding uh, what you can put glaze on, because it's almost like once you, once you share ideas and everyone's like, can I glaze this? Can I glaze this? Can I glaze this? Here's the thing. You can put glaze on anything that can handle heat, Okay, because the glaze has to be embossed with a heat tool. So could you put this glaze on Yupo? Not really, Yupo is gonna melt. Could you put it on plastic? No, nope, it's gonna melt. Uh, transparency, well, it's gonna melt unless it's a heat stable. So 
but you could put it on other things. So what if it wasn't paper? What if it wasn't wood? What if it wasn't chipboard? What if it was something like metal or glass or plastic? Can you use it? Yes, but there's a little kind of in-between trick that you need to know. What I like is understanding that different things in your craft space are embossable, right? For example, ideology heirloom roses, these are made out of metal. I mean, uh, resin. Uh, these are made out of metal, right? Any adornments. So I know that resin, it's not plastic, it's resin and metal are heat stable. That allowed me kind of that, okay, let me try this out. My first go-to was like, ooh, I know how to make the powder stick. I'll use that good old embossing ink. Wrong. This is glycerin based and any kind of ink as a barrier will never dry. So I want you to think of this. If you have a piece of metal and you put ink on it of any kind, let's, let's just say, forget embossing ink. Maybe it was archival or Versamark or any ink that you normally emboss with and you put your embossing powder on and you heat it, would it emboss? Yes. But what happens is that ink that's in between has nowhere to go, right? Because those inks don't air dry. That's why your pad kind of always stays glycerin-y. So essentially you've trapped that ink in between a layer of metal and a layer of plastic, which is what the glaze is. And if you were to scratch it, it would slide right off. So we needed some way to actually bond the powder to the metal or glass or whatever it is we're going to do before we emboss it. And ink is not an option. What is an option? Collage medium, right? Collage medium or gel medium, something that you would normally use to bond something with is what I'm going to use on metal or resin to attach my glaze to. And the beauty of this is that you can use collage medium on anything, right? This is just a great little swatch that I like to share because you can use it for paper, for fabric, and it still feels like fabric, for wood, for plastic, buttons, metal, even metal on metal. These gears are stacked. Glass, right? You can use it to adhere glass, and this is just to an et cetera tag. A great little reminder that you can use collage medium on everything. So it is my glue to attach the powder, the glaze, to the substrate before I emboss. So there's a lot of cool things that we can do and then I'll show you ultimately what, uh, what the effect could be, okay? So they could be a lot of different little charms. They could be flowers, uh, obviously butterflies, arrows, for those that have the adornments, there's some little uh, ideology Milagro charms. You can just add enamel to just that little heart, right? A lot of cool things that we can do or any of those heart charms. It's gonna give you a very different effect than maybe what we would have had with crayon, okay? So what I wanna do is I need to use the collage medium as glue, put the powder over the top, but then I need to emboss it. And that's always a trick. So it's a good idea to plan. So you can do whatever works for you. I just take uh, a craft stick, I take a little square. You could use whatever you want, a glue dot, whatever. This is just a, a foam square. And I'm going to stick my embellishment on there. This is going to allow me the ability to put my glue on and hold it, right? as well as emboss it without the metal getting hot. Because you can't use a tweezer, because then it's not gonna emboss under the tweezer. And if you try to do it on the table, you know, often when you're trying to heat it, if that thing blows across, you don't wanna touch metal ever when you're heating it. <laughs> it will get incredibly hot, okay? So collage medium, how do you apply it? Well, you can apply it uh, however you wish. Just a, a paintbrush is the easiest. You could just take a little paintbrush. Let's see, what do we wanna do? Uh, on this one. I know we already have some bright ones, so let's play with, um, mm, I know a good one. Let's take, do you have those other ones? Ah, oh, this would be a good one. There we go. I was looking for salvage patina. It's not a new color, but I already have some of the new colors done, so you'll see that. But we're just going to take a little bit of collage medium. You don't need much, and you're going to brush it over whatever you want glaze. So in this case, let's just say I want to leave the body of the butterfly silver. Let's get it to focus. There we go. I'm just brushing the collage medium on. I'm not going to put it where the body is because I don't want it. Do you have to do the sides? I don't, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessary, but you can do whatever, whatever works for you. But you do need to work fairly quickly, meaning collage medium is designed to have a drying time of now. Uh, so that just means if you're going to do this, you need to get that on there and then have your glaze at the ready. That's why I went and chose my color. I'm also taking my brush and making sure I don't have any white areas, meaning if I have any uh, collage medium buildup, that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to have because uh, it's just gonna take too long to dry. And then you just cover it, right? Cover it however you want. If this way, and I'll just use the jar to kind of tap the excess, right? Here we go. Cover it with glaze. If you miss a spot, well, you can go back and fix it. Or if you uh, have some on an area where you don't want, I'm just gonna use my same brush just to clean it off because that glue is like a little magnet. 
for the glaze and then I, I can just wipe it off. I clean my brush with water, nothing more because collage medium is water-based. So that's good. That can just sit to dry. It's only gonna take not very long to dry, really. It's only gonna take a, a couple of minutes to dry. And then I put that back. So if it was something resin, for example, you know, how do you do resin ones? Well, you can do the same thing, but you could actually glue these onto one stick. And if you don't want to use foam, could you use a hot glue? Yes, but hot glue, when you heat emboss, gets hot as well and it starts to slide off. So I just found that foam dots kind of work, but whatever's going to, to work on, on keeping something in place, maybe it's a, an adhesive sheet, it, different things, right? But that's just kind of what I do, all right? So the powder that sits there, I'll talk about uh, what is really important to note. And that is just like the paste, the glue needs to dry because if the glue doesn't dry, it can bubble. And when it bubbles up, it's really not that attractive. And I'll show you um, a little difference. I had help from Mario. Thank you, Mario, for helping me with these swatches. Um, but when this works, the technique works, the translucency is stunning. It's really, really beautiful that you uh, have the ability to also see the metal, okay? And that is when the collage medium is dry. How long does it take to dry? Give yourself at least five minutes, okay? That's, that's the best. If you can give yourself longer, that's even better. But you could go in and, and do any of those fancy coloring if you want, just like I did with the Impresslets. But I like the fact that this is going to give it an, a cool enameled look. Ultimately, what, what you achieve is a translucent effect on any kind of substrate. So first thing we're gonna talk about while the metal is drying, and we'll get into the metal, is resin. I like different resin things, and in ideology we have resin flowers, we have salvage dolls, we have a lot of different things that are resin that are embossable. Um, what's great is that you can transform something that seems, well, pretty boring and basic into something really pretty. I like to keep these in here, but look at these. These literally look like vintage cabochons, like almost Bakelite or even some glazed enamels. These are just ideology. In fact, the color of these, I don't know if I have, I'm going to see if I have any. Oh yeah, I do. I have them in my little tin here. So this is what, this is how they come in the package. Um, and to me, they're like a little too uh, bright and cheery, right? A little too, too happy. So glazing them allowed me to change the color, right? So obviously there is a, a cream one. There's a, one of these colors of each one, but like that green, like these are the same greens, but by adding a little bit of cracked pistachio, it was, it allowed me to kind of give it more of a jade look than this, right? This was a little bit of speckled egg. So it took this kind of really pale baby blue and just gave it a little bit of depth. So you can choose whatever color glaze to change the finish of these. And this is done exactly how we did the Impresslet, meaning we, I went in, uh, but it, it, instead of ink, I used collage medium because we, it's the same at the beginning of the demo because it's, it's resin or metal. So collage medium, put the glaze on, let the glaze dry, heat emboss it, but then to get my grunge, to get all that brown in there, it's crayon and a brush, just like what we did to grunge it up. Do you have to grunge it? No, I'll show you the butterflies. We're not going to grunge it, but how cool is that to really, like to me, it brings out all of the features that are in these heirloom roses. Like look at all that depth, same thing, just cool, yeah. I mean, you can see the back of them. See, they don't even finish the bottom. You could, but you know, I, I always like just, just looking at that. It's, it's such a beautiful display of these, but man, it can transform things. So sometimes you could look at things and uh, you know, maybe you're at a junk show or who knows, you know, maybe it's a button. If it can handle heat without melting, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. But I really love how these look and they could be as simple as like an old jewelry box. You can put them in a picture frame. You could make, well, you could make something wearable out of it if you want, but I love all the different colors. Uh, and I actually, I can't wait to make brighter colors of these flowers too. All right, so let's go back to um, the metal, okay? Uh, I know this isn't dry yet. It's almost dry and I could probably, I'll just have Mario do a little drawing. Could you sure. uh, do me a favor and just hold this? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna just do a heat tool, but just keep your distance because we don't want that to emboss yet, just yeah. to kind of warm it up. So he's using the Ranger tool to kind of speed up the drying of the glue. Again, that's kind of a benefit because that tool is gonna take longer to emboss. But ultimately what's gonna happen is that that glaze is going to become translucent and it's going to bring up the metal. But much like the texture paste, okay, if you go in and heat this too quick, you see how this just looks kind of like slime? 
that's what's going to happen. You're going to trap that glue between the metal and it will never become translucent. Even though collage medium, as you saw from here, even on glass, dries clear, it goes on white. You saw it in the jar. It starts out, where is the jar of collage medium? There we go. It starts out white and dries clear. So if you trap that white in between, it will forever look like this. Maybe that's your thing. I don't think so. I don't think that really makes this look good. Okay. So let's see, is that just about done? Probably. Okay. You just feel this metal. That feels pretty good. Okay. Thanks Mario. You're welcome. So we have our collage medium, our glaze, and we're going to emboss it. So when we emboss the metal, here's the thing to know. This metal needs to get up to 340 degrees before that glaze melts. When you're embossing on paper or chipboard, the, as soon as the heat gun hits it, it only takes seconds for that paper to reach that temperature. But metal, as you know, conducts the heat. It's very cold. So we have to get that entire piece of metal that hot. And then as soon as it gets that temperature, essentially your glaze embosses in an instant. But just know that the metal is extremely, extremely hot. Okay? So we're gonna heat this up. We're gonna see if we can watch it on camera, if I can get this to focus. It's like I need my hand in it. I don't know why. It just wants to focus on my hand. Okay, well, we'll do it anyway. Okay. Then, I, then in other words, don't move? Yeah. So I'm, so you're like sitting here going, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. It, it will. You just have to let it do its thing. It takes quite a while, even with this heat tool, because that entire piece of metal has to get that temperature before the magic happens. And it's good to know that because, you know, sometimes if you don't know it, you assume it's done, but it isn't done. And then you stop before it's really finished. And you, I mean, if you stop now, it could look cool, but it's just not done because it's just not shiny yet. All right, it's starting to go. So I can see that it's starting to get a little bit darker on the wings. I don't want to move position because I don't want to screw up the camera, but we're starting to see the shine and that color will start to become translucent. Could you guys see this side? There you go. Did you see the difference between that side and that side? Okay. That's what we're going for. And see how the other side was just instant? Boom. Once it happened, it happened. And it's going to be... It's going to be a subtle tint of color. So could you add another layer? Yes. Could you have painted this first? Like maybe you wanted some areas white or blue. Could you have used paint on the metal before the glaze? Yes, distress paint would work on metal. But this gave it a beautiful tint of color. Sometimes maybe the camera, you're like, oh no, it's silver. No way, it's salvage patina. It's a beautiful tint of color. And that's what I love about doing this on, on a charm. It just gives it, it's still, gives you that metallic look, right? Unlike just doing paint or uh, glossy accents, you get that beautiful glazed look and it's still gonna be hot as blazes. So I'm gonna leave it there for a second, but totally different, right? Between something translucent and something that looks like sludge because you didn't wanna wait. But I just thought it was fun to really show off the colors. So I asked Mario to make the swatches. I'm like, just make me the swatches and I'll, I'll figure out what to, to put them in. But I just thought, what a fun display to make this little rainbow butterfly cloche. So this is an ideology display dome. Uh, just one pack of butterflies. We did one in each of the new colors, right? Picked raspberry, candied apple, wild honey, twisted citron, salty ocean, wilted violet, and then just a stick of wire, hot glue on the back, hot glue for the win, a uh, little bit of floor wire, and just stuck in there at different levels. So this, I mean, I love how the colors, you can just see from the light, like look how well those colors reflect in the light. What a cool little thing. Just a little label tape, little story stick that says wander, but fun, a great way to use your charms, not just for yourself, um, but it's a great gift for a friend and a cool way to use up charms. So let's say you have funky charms. Maybe you're into steampunk. Do this with gears, right? Maybe you have flowers. Maybe you have a bazillion heart charms because, well, that's just you. And you collect every, every heart charm known and you just look at it in a box. Well, how about you look at it in something you made and enjoy it a little bit more than just knowing you have it. I think there's more joy in knowing you used it than knowing you had it. That's what I think as a maker, right? I've learned a lot uh, in all this and I used to be that collector be like, well, I just feel good that I have it. You know, I feel way better that I actually put it to use and made something from it. 
but a display dome, a little ideology, a, a cool way to, to just utilize a technique. Sure, this could go on a card, this could go on a journal, this could be a lot of things, but sometimes just the simplicity is, is magic. So that's what I love about embossing glaze. I mean, you see from, from using it on metals to doing all sorts of different textures, I mean, that's pretty uh, phenomenal. I love that, so I think it's really good. Uh, Mary asks, how many layers? The same layer that I did, one layer, because these new colors, uh, if, you, if you saw from the, the intro, the beginning, brights, right? So uh, these, you saw salvage patina because it's lighter. You would have had to achieve probably two or three layers to get it, you know, to build up color, but salvage patina is a pale color. That's the excitement of these new uh, glazes. They're so bright, one layer, boom, just made these butterflies uh, super, super intense. And I love that. There's some people that say, oh, but I can alcohol ink this and do clear embossing powder. Okay, try that and let me know. You're gonna get a different effect because you're not going to get the shine of the color you're gonna get shine of clear over the color. That's what makes, I think, glaze so, so unique and cool. So the, the brights are really fun because they allow us to create this, but don't get me wrong, I love all of them because I love the subtlety of cracked pistachio and a little tattered rose, some kitsch, but I love all the other colors. So having glaze, super fun. Having glaze to do impresslets, super fun. Having uh, archivals now in all of our colors, amazing. Just, it's fun. It's good fun. And well, I hope you guys enjoyed that.